Okay, uh, this is uh, Chris Nimi speaking. Um, welcome to the Regulatory Systems Project, uh, otherwise uh, uh, known as RAP, uh, webinar on whole house retrofit efficiency programs. Uh, for those of you who don't know, RAP is a nonprofit organization funded through foundations like the Energy Foundation and Climate Works Foundation, as well as government agencies like the U.S. Department of Energy to provide policy and technical assistance to a variety of policymakers and regulators. Uh, this is the third in a series of webinars that uh, RAP has uh, put on uh, with the uh, gracious funding from the Energy Foundation to help Energy Foundation grantees, regulators, and others become better informed on a variety of topics related to energy efficiency. Uh, today we've got uh, a, a panel of um, three experts with um, terrific expertise and experience, uh, particularly my two colleagues in that, those categories. Uh, that will have a lot of uh, hopefully very useful information to share with everybody who is online and on the phone. Um, before we get started, however, I wanted to uh, cover a couple of quick logistical administrative issues. Um, the, the first is to note that um, because there's so many people involved in these kind of webinars, uh, where they don't uh, offer the opportunity for kind of direct dialogue, um, however, we want to offer the opportunity for folks to, to ask a, uh, a question or two if you have something that's particularly burning through the message section in the bottom right-hand corner of the, uh, of the page that you're looking at uh, for the webinar. And um, at the end of each presentation, we'll try to, we're not going to address them as they come in, but at the end of each presentation, try to tackle uh, those that we, that we can get to with, uh, with the time that we have available. And I'll note that to the extent that we can't get to everyone's questions or to the extent that your questions are a little bit too uh, complex uh, to, to try to, to frame in a sentence or two, um, uh, Mark Dian and Tim Kisner and myself have all uh, agreed that we'd be happy to uh, address anything that anyone wants to, to, to post to us in, in follow-up emails or, or telephone calls. Uh, you, you should have our contact information from the presentations that are, that are going to be presented here. Um, second thing I wanted to make sure everyone knew, you probably heard, um, that this uh, webinar is being recorded. And both the recording and the, uh, the, the copies of the presentations themselves will be available on RAP's website. Um, you can simply go to, to www.raponline.org uh, and go to the presentations uh, tab uh, on the left-hand side and you will be able to find them. Um, just in case, however, the, the folks at RAP will be sending out an email to everybody uh, providing you the, the link so that you can get there directly. Um, the last ad administrative thing that I wanted to touch on is that uh, RAP is very, as, as are the presenters, very interested in getting feedback on how the webinar went, um, what you found useful, what you didn't find useful, what you might have liked to have been done differently, and so on. Um, there is a survey uh, as a result, a brief survey that we would uh, appreciate if you would fill out when you leave. Um, in, in order to directly get to that survey, if you would simply click on the X for exit button on the, uh, the webinar uh, when you depart as opposed to simply closing out your browser, um, the survey will come straight to you. So, so again, uh, much appreciated if you, if you would follow through up on, on that. Um, so I'm going to move now to uh, give you a quick uh, overview of the various presenters. Okay, so um, the, the first one is uh, myself. Um, my name is, uh, is Chris Nimi. I am a principal with a small consulting firm called Energy Futures Group. Um, Energy Futures Group uh, works for a variety of um, environmental advocates, uh, state uh, uh, and, and federal government agencies, and uh, occasionally utilities on the design of policies and programs to promote uh, energy efficiency. Um, prior to uh, founding Energy Futures Group uh, this past spring, um, I worked for 17 years for the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, uh, and the last 10 of which I, I managed their um, uh, consulting division that, that did similar work in a variety of different states and provinces as well as a little bit uh, overseas. 
Our second presenter will be Mark Dyan. Uh, Mark is a Executive Vice President with uh, the Conservation Services Group, or CSG. Um, in, he's been with CSG for 20 years, and uh, it, it, he'll go into this a little bit more himself, but I think it's worth noting that, that CSG uh, is a, a company that probably delivers more uh, home performance with Energy Star whole house retrofit programs than any other uh, efficiency program vendor in the country. Uh, they have programs uh, in, a, in a variety of different states and a variety of different regions of the country. Mark leads a strategy development for those and other CSG initiatives. He also oversees CSG's uh, technical uh, building science work. Uh, and, and he's also been directly responsible for managing or overseeing the management of a variety of those home performance uh, with Energy Star programs. So he brings a wealth of of experience to, uh, uh, to this presentation. Our third presenter is Tim Tisner. Uh, Tim is a project manager with the uh, City of Austin, uh, Texas's uh, municipal utility, Austin Energy, uh, where he's worked for uh, about uh, 20 years doing a variety of different things in the energy efficiency field. Um, for those of you who may not know, uh, uh, Austin is the 10th largest uh, municipal utility in the country. Um, and uh, beyond its, its size, I think it's worth saying uh, and, and pretty well recognize that it's, it's always been considered one of the top two or three in terms of its uh, innovation and progressiveness in delivering uh, energy efficiency programs to its members. And, and in fact, it, even outside of the municipal utility realm, it's considered uh, by many people to be uh, one of the very important leaders in the country in, in a variety of efficiency initiatives. Um, during, Kim, during Tim's time at Austin Energy, he's been involved in a variety of different uh, efficiency programs. The one he's going to talk about today is uh, the, uh, it's about an 18-year-old initiative that the City of Austin has, uh, has developed and been implementing to require the, um, the assessment uh, and labeling and disclosure of the efficiency of a home before it is sold. Uh, a very kind of important policy initiative that's been pursued to some degree in some other parts of the world, but, um, uh, but only in, in very limited uh, jurisdictions in the U.S. Uh, today, particularly in the residential sector. So with that, with that backdrop, um, I'll launch into our, uh, our first presentation. Which is mine. Um, to give you a quick overview of what the three of us are going to talk about, I, I'm going to try to uh, address the topic from a, a little higher elevation than, than Mark or Tim to, uh, to, to give folks uh, some, uh, my perspective from having worked on a variety of whole house retrofit programs in, in a variety of different jurisdictions on what, are the, uh, what a good framework for program design um, and for supporting policies would look like and, and what experience in different parts of of the country and the world, for that matter, tell us about the things that we need to do to be successful with whole house retrofit initiatives. Uh, then Mark is going is to uh, take the reins and um, give you a little bit more of an insider's perspective as, as someone who's actually managed and delivered these kind of programs in many different jurisdictions on what the keys to success uh, and with those programs are. And then, as I noted earlier, Tim is going to focus, uh, we'll talk a little bit about Austin's Home Performance with Energy Star program, but focus more of his discussion on building labeling disclosure requirements uh, and a little bit on the interface between those and uh, Austin's Home Performance with Energy Star program. So a, a quick um, uh, outline of, of my presentation. Um, I'll give you a, a, a very brief introduction to myself. Uh, actually, maybe I've already done that, so I'll probably skip over that. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about what is the nature of the opportunity for whole house retrofits from, from an efficiency perspective, uh, the, the size of the efficiency opportunity, and what are the barriers to capturing those energy savings. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, good program design. Um, what, are, what are some of the myths uh, that, that some folks sometimes have about uh, what you need to do to get to this market? Uh, and then what are the, what, what are the strategies that, uh, in, in my view, you actually really need to pursue to address the myriad of market barriers in this market? Uh, and talking a little bit about some design uh, questions and trade-offs that, that Mark and Tim might get into a little bit further later. 
Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about a, uh, the policy framework uh, types of issues that, that are also vitally important. And in some respects, um, and I debated this uh, before putting this presentation together, it, it almost, you almost need to start with a good policy framework, but to explain why, um, I thought I'd get into the little bit more of a discussion of, of the market and the program uh, choices one has to make um, so that when we talk about policies that support those programs, um, there's a little bit of a context for them. And then I'm going to conclude by pre presenting some results from some leading programs, uh, particularly in the U.S. Okay. So um, uh, this is a, a brief summary of, uh, of my firm, Energy Futures Group. Uh, as noted earlier, we do a variety of, uh, of uh, work on program design and policy development, um, including some work on building codes uh, for a variety of clients, but particularly uh, government agencies, uh, state and, and federal, and just sometimes local, um, as well as environmental and consumer advocates, uh, regulators, and utilities. So, um, why should we why should we care? Why are people talking a lot these days about uh, about whole house um, retrofit programs? I'm having struggling to keep the slides uh, all on the screen here. Um, the, the 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 bottom line um, from from my perspective is that when you when you look at how energy is used in a home uh, across the United States, about half of all energy is used for heating and or cooling the home, and uh, in, the, in, in colder climates, particularly in the Northeast and the Midwest, um, it can be 60%. So the, the things that affect the operating efficiency on heating and cooling include the heating and cooling equipment themselves, but the, the building um, in, in many respects is, is even more important, or, or at least as important. Um, and uh, while the opportunity is great in, a, in addressing the thermal envelope uh, and uh, in the heating and cooling systems, um, to date, relatively little effort has been focused in the, the various efficiency programs across the country on addressing this particular set of opportunities. Uh, the, the exceptions are that there have been programs to promote efficient central air the sale of efficient central air conditioners and uh, furnaces and, and boilers, usually when they're, they're about to be replaced and you're trying to influence the decision someone is making about whether to purchase an 80% AFUE furnace or a condensing 90% or 95% uh, AFUE furnace. But other than those equipment uh, purchases, those heating and cooling equipment purchases, there's been relatively little focus historically um, on, on building retrofits, on, on dealing with the, with the house as a whole, if you will, uh, despite the fact that that's where probably the lion's share of the savings opportunities exist. Now, there's a whole variety of reasons that that's been the case, and you'll, we'll get into them um, as we proceed through these, these presentations. But the, the bottom line I wanted to leave with everybody here is that there's an enormous potential here. There's an enormous cost-effective potential here, and the challenge is figuring out how to tap it um, programmatically or, and or through policies. So um, why doesn't all of this stuff happen on its own? Well, there, there are a whole host of barriers that, um, of market barriers that prevent uh, consumers from investing in uh, what are cost effective, what we all know are cost effective efficiency opportunities in their homes. First of all, um, uh, as anyone who's taken Economics 101 can tell you, um, the presumption that, that markets uh, uh, are, are perfect uh, mechanisms for allocating resources is, is predicated on the assumption that everybody acting in those markets has perfect information. They, they understand everything so that they can make perfectly rational choices. Um, now, we all know that while that may be an ideal, it does not represent how things work in reality. Uh, consumers do lack information on a whole variety of different things, including um, the benefits of efficiency. Uh, and not just the money-saving benefits of efficiency, but the many other benefits that efficiency often brings as well. Um, getting rid of ice dams and therefore you know, damage to your, to your roof uh, by eliminating leaks into an attic. Um, uh, improvements in health and safety, improvements in comfort, and, and so on. Uh, secondly, uh, consumers, even if they wanted to act on efficiency, are often um, uh, 
I guess an extreme way of putting it, paralyzed uh, by difficulty that they have in identifying uh, who they should go to for help. Um, there are many contractors who, who uh, uh, one can potentially hire, uh, but it's not abundantly clear. Um, in fact, you could look in the yellow pages and you won't find uh, typically um, some, uh, a heading that says whole house retrofit contractors or, or anything like it. You can go to insulation contractors, you can go to heating and cooling contractors, um, but you don't know if they are capable of, of, of helping you address your, your house uh, in its entirety. And, e and even if you did, you, didn't, you don't have any good way of knowing which ones are good uh, and reputable and which ones aren't. And these days when consumers are, are very busy, they have um, many needs uh, in their home and their families and their work to attend to. Um, if it's not simple for them uh, to figure out where to go, uh, inertia takes over and uh, nothing happens. The, second, uh, the, the third uh, uh, barrier here for consumers is that for many of them, um, access to capital is a problem. Uh, whole house retrofits typically require significant upfront uh, financial investment, you know, at least on the order of five to $10,000 a house. Uh, for many consumers, uh, that kind of money is not easy to, uh, to access, uh, uh, or, or at least not expeditiously. <laughs> Then we have the problem of split incentives uh, between particularly, this is referring to the rental market where landlords um, have no incentive to uh, invest in efficiency if their tenants are the ones paying the bills and um, the, the tenants have no in incentive to invest in efficiency if they don't know if they're gonna be living in that apartment uh, or that house for more than another year or two. Then re related to a, a couple of the earlier barriers, um, there are concerns um, about risk. Uh, and, 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 and the risk here is that uh, consumers in an ideal world would know that the efficiency investments that they are making um, provide 30% uh, you know, savings on their heating bill or, or whatever the number may be. Uh, however, they don't know whether that's really the case, even if they have a a qualified uh, contractor telling them so. And when we, there's been a lot of uh, information in the literature recently uh, explaining that and making clear that consumers are typically uh, risk averse. As a result, they tend to underinvest uh, in things like efficiency. Uh, then there's the issue of transaction or hassle costs. Um, uh, again, in, in our very busy daily lives, um, it's, uh, it's not easy to find the time to uh, identify a bunch of contractors who might help you figure out what's wrong with your house, um, to uh, uh, get bids from those contractors on what kind of work will be done, um, to evaluate whether you can afford them, um, to come back to the house to let them in uh, when you've actually selected someone and, and they've come to start doing the work, uh, to oversee that work, that, that takes a lot of time. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it means taking time off work, and, and those are all transaction costs that stop people from, from doing these, these kind of projects on their home. And, and then, perhaps not lastly, but at least, but lastly on this list, uh, there are probably others that I haven't uh, identified here, uh, home, home retrofit efficiency improvements are not visible. It's not like a solar panel on your roof. Um, that's the kind of sexy thing you can use to show off to your neighbors. And like it or not, that stuff's important in the way uh, consumer markets work today. And uh, uh, as a result, um, efficiency is, is kind of out of sight, uh, out of mind. Now that's just on the consumer side, uh, the, the demand side, if you will. On the supply side, the, the contractors who could do this work, many of them lack the technical tools and skills to properly assess what the efficiency opportunities in a home are and to properly treat them. And then analogous to the, the difficulty that consumers have in identifying quality contractors, the quality contractors have difficulty differentiating themselves from their uh, cutthroat, low cost, uh, and maybe not as skilled um, competitors. And if you can't differentiate yourself as, as, a, as a quality contractor, it's very difficult to charge the premium that's necessary to truly do a good job. Um, contractors themselves also face risks. To do the kind of work that we're talking about with whole house retrofits requires really a, a different business model than most contractors have historically pursued in, in selling heating and cooling equipment, for example. 
And if they're going to invest in a brand new business model and, and substantially change uh, the way they run their business, um, they need some certainty that, that that business opportunity is going to exist for a while, and, and, and that's, a, that's a risky proposition for them. Um, next, well, even for the contractors who are technically adept, um, many of them do not have uh, uh, terrific sales skills. I'm reminded of a, of a story that uh, I was once told by a distributor, one of the major distributors in the Northeast, of uh, heating and cooling equipment, where uh, he, he pointed out that these days, uh, water heaters, uh, about 60%, uh, and this is a couple years old, so the numbers may be different now, but more than half of, of water heaters are sold these days through big box stores, the, the Home Depots and, and Lowe's and, and Sears of the world. And if you look at the sales of those water heaters, um, they, they typically offer three choices, good, good better, and best. And if you look at the, the sales data from, from those big box stores, uh, the frequency with which the, the cheapest, the, uh, the, the lowest end, uh, gets sold is relatively small, something like 15%. Um, they, they have figured out how to market to consumers in, in ways that sell consumers up to at least the, the mid-level uh, uh, products. Whereas if you were to look at the, the, the same kind of, of distribution of sales of water heaters among the plumbers who sell water heaters directly to consumers, uh, their sales were dominated by, uh, by the low-end efficiency uh, product. Um, so scale, sales skills are, are critically important, um, particularly for something like efficiency, which is, is not visible or sexy, uh, and, and there's some work to be done there. And the last uh, market barrier here, here for under contractors, inadequate capacity refers not to barriers that individual contractors um, face, uh, but the fact that the number of qualified contractors available to, uh, to service the, what, what should be the ideal size uh, retrofit efficiency market um, is, is far too small. Now, we need to grow that market. We need to grow the capability. And then lastly, I think it's important to note that um, one of the reasons that consumers don't invest in efficiency in their homes, uh, at least not in the things that you can easily and readily see, are that lenders don't value those efficiency improvements when they make their appraisals. Um, as a result, a consumer doesn't know when they are going to sell their house if they're going to be able to get the money, that, money back that they invested in the efficiency. So all of these, these barriers conspire to uh, uh, minimize the number of households that are prepared to invest in whole house uh, retrofit improvements. <coughs> so now what can we do about that um, from a program design perspective? Well, um, I want to start by laying out a couple of myths that, uh, that we, we hear a lot, um, uh, too often, um, from, from folks uh, about this market. Um, the, the first is and probably most folks on the line are familiar with this, but I think it's worth, it's worth restating nonetheless. Uh, there, are, there was a time when, uh, back in the 80s when, uh, when much of our community thought that if we simply offered a bunch of free audits addressing the information barrier, if you will, and just educating consumers, um, that, that would just create a flood of demand for retrofit efficiency investments. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, uh, the, the flood of free audits that were provided to consumers back in the 1980s um, had uh, notoriously uh, low or poor uh, uptake in terms of the follow-through investments in efficiency, except in cases when they were, um, when they were married to substantially, uh, sub other substantial elements of, of, a, of a program, including financial incentives. Now, on the other hand, we sometimes hear from folks um, that, uh, that the access to capital is the only important market barrier and that if, if we simply provided uh, attractive financing to everybody, um, that's all we would need to get consumers to pay for retrofits. Uh, again, um, that's, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a myth um, that has been uh, 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 examined in, in some detail and, 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 put in, and clearly uh, shown to be a myth. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll note for folks' reference, a, a couple of years ago, uh, Marianne Fuller, who now works for Lawrence Berkeley National, National Lab, um, did a, a paper for uh, the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, my former employer, 
uh, that surveyed um, the results of financing programs for residential efficiency investments uh, across North America and, and demonstrated conclusively that, um, that financing by itself accomplished uh, relatively little. The bottom line is we have a we have a uh, a basic supply and demand problem. Um, we have too little of both. Um, there are, as noted earlier, many many market barriers. As a result, there is no single magic bullet solution to either the supply or the demand problem. And because there's many market barriers, we need a complex um, set of strategies that, in an integrated way addresses all of those barriers. Uh, it, moreover, that strategy uh, needs to be uh, creative. Uh, that is, it needs to be adapted to local market conditions because um, just as all consumers are different, <coughs> uh, the, the nature of the barriers and the opportunities are also going to be different from region to region in, in this country and probably even from locality to locality to some degree. Uh, and then also because this is a complex market and local conditions um, are different uh, and we are unlikely to get it perfectly right the first time, um, it's really important that whatever strategy we put in place uh, is intentionally um, flexible and nimble uh, so that it can respond to market feedback if something isn't working, uh, we can change course or alternatively if something's working really well, we can put more effort into that particular element of our overarching strategy. Uh, this, this slide is intended to um, hammer home the point that uh, we have uh, inadequate contractor capacity. This is a slide um, that shows the number of individuals with certifications from the Building Performance Institute, which is probably, many folks know, is the uh, national organization that, that most uh, programs look to. Um, to uh, establish the technical standards uh, and, and train and certify, well, they don't train, but uh, to certify contractors, uh, technicians, um, who meet uh, good uh, building science uh, standards in terms of knowing what they're doing. Um, what you see in, in, the, uh, in the last column on the right-hand side um, is an estimate of the number of certified technicians um, you would have to have per million households if you wanted to treat uh, with retrofit activity, uh, retrofit investments, 50% of the housing stock in 10 years. Now, that would be a very aggressive goal. It's the kind of goal that some countries in Europe are talking about. Um, uh, but even if you wanted to do it in 20 years, uh, uh, you can cut that, that number in half. Um, and then you can compare it to what we've actually got um, in terms of uh, I'm sorry, I, I, let me restate that. The, you, the, the number you'd have to have to treat half of the homes in, in 10 years is the 10,000 number at the bottom of the slide here. And what you've got here are the top 10 states in terms of the number that they currently have per million households. And you can see that only Vermont and New York, uh, this was about a year ago, so things are, may have changed a little bit, but not dramatically, only Vermont and New York had even a tenth of what was necessary to, uh, uh, to meet that standard. Now I'll, I'll note, and Mark will talk a little bit more about this as well in his presentation, that um, one doesn't necessarily have to have uh, only BTI certified technicians. There are undoubtedly others that are also uh, adequately skilled that haven't gone through the process of getting certified by BTI. Um, but, but nevertheless, it's, it's an indicator um, that we have uh, work to do in growing the delivery capability of the retrofit contracting industry. Okay, so if we have a supply and demand problem, um, how, do we, uh, how do we tackle it? Well, I'm going to start with, with the building the supply capacity. Uh, first, most, uh, most, effective, uh, most of the effective uh, whole house retrofit programs uh, today focus some of their attention <coughs> on providing technical training to contractors who can provide these retrofit services. Um, they also support uh, typically uh, some form of certification, often the Building Performance Institute certification, uh, as well as accreditation of the firms that those certified contractors work for so that they can give customers a, a list of contractors that have um, certified technicians and or that are accredited. 
Then they also provide uh, quality assurance. Um, that is, they perform inspections of some portion of the work that's been done to, to make sure that it's been performed to the standards that, that we uh, would expect and that are important. Um, and those standards are important for a couple of reasons. One is uh, you won't get all of the savings that you want to get um, if the insulation isn't uh, installed correctly, if the uh, heating and cooling system isn't installed correctly, and so on. So it, it's an important from, from a savings perspective. Uh, it's also important from the perspective of the reputation of the, of the industry and of the program. Uh, and if you have some highly publicized uh, poor workmanship, um, it, can, it can be a really difficult um, uh, reputation to overcome, even if uh, there were just a few bad apples that were, were producing those problems. And then lastly, um, one of the keys to building the supply capacity is, is driving demand. These, these two things are not completely independent of each other. Um, contractors will not invest in a new business model if they don't see the opportunities for growth in demand, uh, or at least for, for potential for growth in demand. Now, what do we do about driving demand on the, on the uh, demand side? Um, again, there are a whole variety of strategies. The, the, the ones that are, are typically uh, seen in, in many programs are some sort of, of upfront financial rebate. Um, this is important not just to defray the total cost of the investment, uh, in my view, um, but also the fact that someone is, is willing to put um, some dollars on the table, I think, uh, sends a, a message to consumers that this is this is something that they ought to con, ought to consider as as serious and valuable. And then thirdly, the the fact that there is some sort of financial incentive gives <coughs> gives contractors uh, some talking points that they could use in in selling consumers on retrofit investments. Um, financing for for the balance of the investment for those consumers who need it uh, can also be important. Um, it's also important to figure out how, you know, how do we get to those, those customers in the first place. Well, we, we know that something like um, uh, five to seven percent of all furnaces and central air conditioners are replaced in homes every year. If we could simply leverage all of those investments so that at the time those heating and cooling systems are replaced, uh, that they also invest in the thermal envelope of the home, um, uh, we would be wildly successful and, and, and well on our way to, to treating uh, half of all the homes in 10 years. Um, today, we don't, we don't capture anywhere near that, that portion of the heating and cooling system replacement market. Uh, nevertheless, it, could, it, it should serve as a good entree uh, to talking with consumers. We, we could leverage the interactions they already have with their HVAC contractors if we work well with those HVAC contractors to uh, to support our program. Um, contractor sales training is, a, is another element uh, addressing one of the barriers discussed earlier. Um, providing referrals to quality contractors so those, those quality contractors can more effectively market their, their services is important. <coughs> and of course, um, there's traditional marketing and, uh, and free marketing in the form of, of public relations. You see, in most programs, you see uh, most or all of those components. Now beyond those kind of standard features, there's some other ideas that, um, that have begun to be tested or tried uh, and in some cases maybe haven't uh, been tested or tried very, you know, beyond uh, you know, small pilot type efforts, but that I think are worth uh, considering um, uh, from the perspective of, of uh, a, a broader uh, reach into, into the market for, for driving demand. Um, one is to go beyond HVAC contractors and to think of, of other interactions consumers have for investments in their home that could also serve as on-ramps for more comprehensive treatment of efficiency opportunities in their home. Um, one is window replacements. Um, uh, some of us in the efficiency industry sometimes uh, get a little frustrated with what we think of as uh, uh, window sales uh, folks uh, dramatically overselling the efficiency improvements that consumers can get from investing in, in windows. And as a result, I think we, don't, we tend not to talk to those folks. Um, maybe that needs to change. Um, similarly, when uh, you know, a certain per percentage of homes every year have uh, their, their siding replaced or roofing uh, work done, those may also be opportunities for 
um, for alerting consumers, uh, particularly if we develop relationships with the contracting community that serves them, uh, to invest in more efficiency uh, measures. Uh, then in, in some jurisdictions, at least in some pilot uh, ways, there's, there's been experimentation with much more intensive consumer handholding so that um, we minimize the transaction costs for consumers um, by essentially giving them a retrofit advisor that they can trust. Uh, to help them figure out what to do, to help them figure out which contractor to hire, and so on. Uh, then we also ought to be thinking about what we can do to, to educate the lender and the and, and appraiser community about um, factoring in the benefits of efficiency into their decision making. Um, there's been some efforts in, uh, some very uh, intriguing efforts in some parts of the country <coughs> to uh, leverage uh, uh, or, or to, to use community-based social marketing approaches to more effectively sell uh, efficiency services to, to consumers. Um, to, to just give one example, um, uh, there, there's a very kind of uh, innovative program manager in, in Charlottesville, Virginia, who's running a, a program that has, has pursued a variety of really interesting ideas along, along these paths along this line, and uh, you know, one of the more intriguing ones to me was um, she held a competition between nonprofits in her city using what's uh, indirectly what one might uh, call affinity marketing. And um, the, the competition uh, uh, essentially challenged each of those retrofits, uh, each of those nonprofits to get as many of their members, whether it's a church or an environmental group or whatever else, um, to participate in a whole house retrofit program. And whichever nonprofit got the most participants within a certain period of time um, would get a free assessment and efficiency upgrade on their on their their own facilities. Um, it's it's a kind of uh, uh, of thing that that engages people in in ways that um, uh, or and through mechanisms that they care about uh, and and can actually see uh, you know namely the communities um, with which they are involved. And, and, and Tim is going to talk more about this, um, requirements for the labeling of the efficiency of buildings um, can potentially be a very valuable tool in promoting uh, uh, retrofit investments. If you think about um, a, a homeowner who has a relatively inefficient home, if they had to have the efficiency of that home graded and labeled, the home labeled, and then that, uh, that label or that grade disclosed to potential buyers, um, the, the value that they're going to get for that home may decline. In fact, there's been some uh, research done in Australia to suggest that's exactly what happened when they pursued the strategy. And conversely, the value of homes that were quite efficient uh, could go up. And that would produce an, uh, an incentive for, for the owners of inefficient homes potentially to make investments in efficiency before they put the home on the market or alternatively to offer a discount on the price of their home that the home buyer could then uh, use to invest in, in efficiency once they purchase the home. Then there's some other creative financing instruments uh, like on-bill financing and uh, we're all, our community was all agog about, um, about PACE financing which, uh, which is um, off the table for the moment, but, but other creative financial instruments can be important. And then lastly, I think it's worth noting that um, we need to spend more time and resources testing uh, and developing and testing more innovative solutions to, to driving demand in this market. Uh, the, the point of this slide is just to, to, to show that, and I think this is true not just with whole house retrofits but with any efficiency program, <coughs> that you need to understand all of the barriers to consumers investing in efficiency and make sure that the strategies that you're using in concert with each other are comprehensively addressing um, all of those uh, all of those barriers if you leave some if there's no X's in some of these rows on barriers then you're then you're in trouble you're not going to succeed now um, and mark will talk a little bit more about this in his presentation so I won't go into this in detail but I wanted to flag um, a, a, a couple of key uh, program design choices uh, or set of trade-offs that anyone investing in a, a whole house retrofit program needs to consider. <coughs> the first is who is going to do the home assessment uh, or, the, or the audit as it's commonly uh, referred to these days, although as we probably need to stop referring to it as, as an audit. 
Um, if one option is to have uh, the a vendor like CSG or Honeywell or the other competitors in this market uh, that you might hire to deliver your program for you to go out and do the, the assessments or audits themselves and then to, to drive work from those audits uh, or those assessments um, to qualified uh, retrofit contractors. There are advantages of doing that. You can get going more quickly if you do that. Um, however, if you really want to, to move this market uh, substantially in the long term, you really need the private sector, in my view, to have the capability to provide uh, those kind of assessments. So you're going to need to figure out a, a, uh, which, which one or which hybrid of those options you're going to pursue. The, the second question to think about are what technical standards will your program use? Um, ideally, we want uh, only people who are um, uh, very well trained and um, very knowledgeable on building science to be uh, doing all of the retrofit work in these homes. Um, I, for example, folks that have BPI certification. The problem with, with that, uh, uh, at least in the short run, <coughs> is that many, um, many jurisdictions, uh, the contractor base uh, is, is not very conversant at all with a lot of key elements of building science, um, has very, may have very few certified uh, technicians, and to build that capacity takes time. So again, this is this this issue is a uh, is, is one that that's a trade-off between how quickly you want to get results in terms of work being done in your in your community, and um, and what the what your long-term goal for moving and transforming the market uh, might be, and, and how you view, view the trade-off between those two objectives. Uh, similarly, the, the, the next one: How comprehensive will your program aim to be in treating the efficiency opportunities in homes? Again, in my ideal world, um, you would want to get very deep savings in every home you treat, uh, because once you treated a home and gotten 20% savings, it's, it's often difficult to go back to that house to get the next increment. Um, first, because there are fixed costs of getting to, the, to each home, and once you've incurred them, them once, um, going back for another increment of savings may, may no longer be cost effective, uh, either to, from a program perspective or for the participant's perspective. <laughs> Secondly, you, you're, you're now imposing a second round of hassle costs on the, on the consumers, which make it less likely that they're going to be willing to take on a second visit uh, three or four or five years later. Um, and then third, you, you may leave them with the impression that they've already done everything they need to do. Uh, so for all of those reasons, one would want to get as comprehensive a treatment of the efficiency opportunities in a home as, as possible. However, um, comprehensively treating more participants um, uh, comprehensively treating participants uh, as, as a goal uh, inevitably means, at, at least to some degree, that you're going to treat fewer participants in the short run. There's, there's a, for financial reasons, if, if no other reason, there, there are trade-offs there to be made. Are you interested in more participation? Are you interested in deeper savings? And, and how do you strike the balance there? And then, then lastly, how does this program inter integrate or relate to other programs in a, in a portfolio? Uh, there are a number of examples of, of uh, balkanized portfolios of programs where uh, the program manager running a air conditioner and furnace rebate program is competing with the program manager running the home performance with, with Energy Star whole house retrofit program uh, for, for customers because they, own, they each have their own goals uh, to achieve. And, and you're going to have to, to – that, that is not a good thing from either program's perspective or for the consumer's perspective. And you're going to have to figure out ways to make sure um, that the services offered to consumers across a range of programs are offered as much as possible in an integrated way. So uh, again, Mark will talk about this uh, more than I will, but, um, but there are some potential compromises you can pursue here, including <coughs> um, phasing in the frequency with which the audits or assessments are done uh, by pri the private sector contractors. Um, phasing in the requirements for some uh, high-level technical standards, uh, and maybe providing options for, for single measures, so less comprehensive treatment of homes, but uh, encouraging the development of long-term investment plans, um, and then maybe through your financial incentive structure offering bonuses for more comprehensive treatment, so that you don't lose any participants who, who want to just kind of dip their toe in the water, um, but you encourage them once they're willing to do that to, uh, to go uh, to stick as much of their uh, 
uh, ankle, leg, and body in as, uh, as you can get them to as well. So now we're going to switch to the policy framework, um, and I want to touch on a, on a couple of different topics here. <coughs> uh, program goals, cost effectiveness requirements, um, what the funding level for your program might be, uh, what's the, the length of time over which there's a commitment to the program, is this a one-year, two-year, ten-year time horizon we're thinking about here, what's the program management structure or in, and infrastructure, what is the degree of flexibility in modifying the design or the implementation details that you're giving to the folks who are running this for you? And um, what complementary policies could we consider to, uh, to support uh, whole house retrofit initiatives? So on, on the goals, I just wanted to flag the fact that the, it's important to understand what the drivers in your state or your community are uh, for this kind of program. Um, because the drivers affect, uh, to some degree, the design that, that it makes sense for you to pursue. And there are a variety of different drivers that one can have. Um, in many cases, what, these th what this boils down to is, what is the balance that uh, your policymakers are, um, are, are expecting um, with respect to short-term and long-term objectives? Uh, as noted in a couple of instances earlier, if you want short-term participation and savings, you do things a little bit differently than if you're more interested in building the pipeline for the long term. Um, and uh, understanding those trade-offs is, is critically important. So uh, now switching to cost-effectiveness requirements. Um, there's a couple of things to say on this topic. The, the, the first is that uh, from, from, uh, as a former believer in myself in the total resource cost test, the TRC, uh, I've uh, become concerned that particularly for programs with whole house retrofits, um, that it may be, that test may be problematic. And, and the reason it may be problematic is that it ignores um, a variety of substantial non-energy benefits that are often critically important to getting consumers to participate in these, these kind of initiatives and to invest in, in retrofit uh, efficiency services in their home. And again, we're talking about things like improvements in comfort, um, the durability of the home, health and safety, and so on. Because the TRC typically uh, looks uh, the way it's implemented in most jurisdictions, it looks at <coughs> all of the costs but only the energy portion of the benefits, it provides a skewed perspective on, on cost effectiveness. Um, initially, in its original incarnation decades ago, the TRC was intended to look more comprehensively at, um, at benefits, including non-energy benefits, but in, in practice, it, it never has. So, in, in, in this kind of program, those, those things are absolutely critical. So there are a variety, in several jurisdictions, there are a variety of different uh, solutions that are being considered to address that, that concern. Um, one is to switch to a different test. This is my personal preference, uh, to, to switch to the utility cost test, where you're simply comparing the energy benefits to, uh, to rate payers to the uh, investment that the utility has to make um, if the utility is the one that's running a program. Um, rather than the whole cost. So if the utility is providing a rebate for a third of the cost you only cons of, the, of the retrofit investment, you only consider that 33% of the cost on the cost side of the cost effectiveness calculation. You don't consider the other portion that the consumers are investing in out of their own pocket. Uh, again, this is more of an apples to apples comparison. It's, it's the utility investment of money compared to the utility ratepayer benefits from reduction in consumption of their fuel. Um, the, the, the second alternative that, that are being considered in some jurisdictions is to adjust the cost side of the equation on the TRC by looking at the, uh, the, the portion, through survey work, the portion of um, uh, the reason to the extent that you can quantify this, that consumers are, are investing in the efficiency retrofit. If, they, if the consumers say, well, half the reason I did it on average was for these non-energy benefits and half of it was to save energy and, and the related uh, financial savings, um, then you would adjust the cost of the, of the investment by half. And then the last option is to, to use the TRC, but <coughs> to find ways to uh, quantify some of the non-energy benefits and make sure that they're captured on the benefit side of the equation in the TRC test, uh, a, a, a challenging prospect. 
Um, the other cost effectiveness issue that's worth uh, flagging here is uh, the time horizon uh, that you're looking at. Most whole house retrofit programs um, will not be cost effective in the first year. The first year, uh, you're incurring a lot of uh, infrastructure building costs, training contractors, uh, putting systems in place, beginning marketing to consumers. <coughs> it's often not until the third year, sometimes even later, that you're getting enough volume of participation and therefore savings um, to make the programs pass screening. And it's important, therefore, that when you're when you're prospectively looking at cost effectiveness, that you take a you know a longer uh, a longer view. Um, to demonstrate to regulators, if you need to do that, that this is in fact a good program to run. I'm not going to run through this slide. Um, this is just, uh, you can look at it at your own leisure later. It's just uh, an explanation for a numerical explanation <coughs> through a hypothetical example of what um, the different, the, what the TRC test looks like today and, uh, and what the three different options for looking at cost effectiveness differently uh, might do um, with respect to this, this sample calculation. Um, if anyone's interested, uh, there's an, uh, in the 2010 ACEEE summer study, uh, Marty Kushler and I wrote a paper um, on this topic, which would, uh, uh, and I believe this chart is in there, so it would elaborate a little bit further. Okay. Um, Funding, in terms of commitment for the funding. Um, success does not come cheaply with whole house retrofit programs. There are fixed costs for administration, training, outreach, putting data tracking systems in place, and so on. You have to spend some money on marketing. Um, you typically need to subsidize the audits or assessments, and as noted earlier, you need to provide some financial incentive, plus, uh, in, in, from my point of view, a comprehensiveness bonus. Um, Though it requires a non-trivial chunk of change to uh, to do all that. that you know, the payoff, of course, is uh, can be significant savings in homes, but um, but it, again, it doesn't come cheaply. <coughs> As a result, these kind of programs, at least per unit of first-year savings, which unfortunately is sometimes uh, the metric that people look at when they're when they're judging what a portfolio of programs ought to uh, ought to include. Um, the savings per first, the, the the cost per first unit of per unit of first year savings is uh, is typically relatively high, um, and the, the bottom line point from all of this is that again, uh, this is the kind of program that needs at least a five year look, uh, five year perspective, a five year vision, and, and ideally an even longer term one than that. Okay, program management structure. So. Um, we've, we've got a program designed, we've got it approved, now we've got to uh, figure out how it's going to get implemented. You know, how do we, uh, what, what are the keys on that front? Um, I'll start by noting that uh, this, these can be complex programs, and because of that, uh, it's really important that the, the myriad of tactics and strategies that you're, you're pursuing simultaneously are carefully uh, integrated. Um, with each other, so that so that we're all they're all kind of helping us move in the same direction at the same time. At the same time, as complex as the as the program uh, is from a design and implementation standpoint, we need to make it as simple as possible for the end use consumer, uh, and and that again really puts a lot of, uh, uh, of of onus on the folks who are delivering it um, to, to to pay a lot of, of attention to simplicity in messaging and consistency in messaging, and of course. Um, we would want anybody who's running a program to be a, to be accountable for the results. So, from my perspective, the ideal solution is that you have a single entity that's responsible for all of the program elements, and that same entity is accountable for, for meeting a set of goals. Um, there are a number of jurisdictions with which I'm familiar where uh, at least the marketing function is is treated as a, a different function that gets uh, bid out to a different contractor and the, the contractor responsible for delivering the whole house retrofit program has to figure out how to work with that marketing firm. <coughs> um, while in theory that can work, it, it simply imposes, an, 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 from my perspective, an additional a layer of complexity on what's already a fairly complex uh, initiative. So for, not, not the ideal way to go, I don't think. Um, for reasons noted earlier, flexibility is, is important. Um, you need to be able to uh, modify your strategy as, as you go. 
um, locking in designs uh, as, as is sometimes um, the case uh, in, in different states from a regulatory perspective is, um, is problematic. Um, and micromanaging decisions is also problematic. Again, my ideal solution is you, you give a, a contractor uh, a, a set of goals, perhaps for a multi-year goals, um, you give them the budget for meeting those goals, and you give them flexibility within reasonable limits to, to modify their strategy for meeting those goals. Um, lastly, complementary policies. Um, again, Tim's going to talk more about building labeling and disclosure. Um, there are some strategies uh, that have been pursued in some municipalities around rental energy codes. Uh, and um, there are in incentives for renewable energy investments that can also sometimes be effectively leveraged um, as well. Uh, not many jurisdictions have these things, but um, to the extent that they are possible to consider in your community, um, they would really help. <coughs> so I'm going to conclude by talking a little bit about results that we've seen from some leading programs uh, in the U.S. at least. <coughs> and what you see here is a uh, a graph that, that, that um, provides for several of the leading home performance programs in the U.S. for 2009, the number of participants there were in that program, the number of households that got whole house retrofit treatments, <coughs> and that's the number of the, on the top of each bar. Uh, but the, the, the size of the bar is um, that number of whole house uh, retrofits divided by the number of single family homes in the particular jurisdiction. In other words, What's the portion of the eligible market that we're treating? Um, the, the bottom line from this, from this slide is that uh, in most cases, um, and, and often being a, a one notable exception, uh, we're getting to less than half a percent of the homes, the eligible homes uh, in the retro, retrofit market each year, even in the leading programs in the U.S., and in many cases substantially less than that. Now, if we use 2010 numbers, most of these bars would go a little higher because there has been significant ramp up in, in recent years. But still, we have a long way to go if we want to get to uh, half of the market even within, within 20 years. Uh, and what are we seeing in terms of savings? Um, the best programs are, are achieving about 30% uh, heating and cooling savings. Um, there are pilot initiatives in, in Europe and the U.S. that are exploring how to get more than that, but, um, but that seems to be the, uh, uh, the benchmark at the moment. So um, I will, that's, that's the end of my uh, introduction to this. I will stop there and, um, and maybe ask Mark um, if, if you've seen any uh, questions uh, crop up that I can, <coughs> I can take a few minutes to address. Um, I'll go ahead and try to do that. Um. Let's see, there were two questions. One was that, uh, that you might want to answer. One is, uh, uh, Irina asked, uh, have any jurisdictions actually hit all the key suggestions you described? Uh, um, well, that's a great question. Um, and I'm not sure I have a definitive answer off the top of my head. Um, there, I think most, the leading jurisdictions noted have have done a lot of the basic all of the basic things that, that I've identified, uh, or at least most of them. Um, I don't think there's been a lot of work talking, for example, to lenders and, and appraisers about what can be done to uh, to change the way they they value uh, things when when homes are are sold. Um, but uh, and, and I think, as I noted earlier, that some of the there, there's a uh, there's a slide on some of the innovations in in driving demand um, where we, I don't think as a community nationally, um, have uh, in most cases um, uh, tried some of the innovative things to, to drive demand. So I, I think that many jurisdictions have done, uh, the leading jurisdictions have done um, most of the basics, but not all, um, and, but few of the, of the uh, innovative new things that ought to be tried. Uh, and actually, maybe Mark, you could chime in and see, tell me, you know, if you would agree with that, or Tim yeah, too. I agree. I think the, if you look at that, the statistics on the uh, uh, sort of where the highest production are, they tend to line up with people who have done the most of these things. Uh, uh, and then there's some. You, you were going through. I think uh, intense community work is uh, Austin has done it over a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's 
if you sort of drilled into a few places in the, in the ones I'm familiar with in Oregon or Massachusetts or New York, you'd find some communities that are you know have significantly higher percentages uh, in those uh, because because there's been intensive community work. So I think there's there's more of that going around. Right, and, and I think the reason that we haven't seen more of that um, of that type of intensive community work is because it's expensive. And um, typically, the, where there have been these programs funded by by electric or gas utility ratepayers, um, they have to operate within uh, you know constrained budgets, and um, uh, those budgets have not allowed the level of intensity of, of uh, kind of community initiatives uh, you know across an entire state, for example, um, that would be necessary to drive those numbers up very high. And I. I think that's also, and Tim could speak to this potentially as well, perhaps part of the reason for, for Austin's uh, great success is they, they've been doing this for 20 years. <clears throat> they have a, a decent sized community, but it's, but it's not gigantic. Um, and, uh, and they have the support in their community to, to internalize a lot of the costs of providing you know, the hand-holding to consumers, <clears throat> the outreach to the real estate industry, and so on that, that few jurisdictions have demonstrated to date. Yeah, I, I, th this is Tim. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with the comments that Chris and um, and Mark have made about Austin, Texas, um, being a, a mature DSM market uh, for uh, for the last uh, since 1982. So it's really been it's really been a, a unique sit situation when we've gone and introduced new program offerings into our marketplace, or even with the disclosure ordinance and the way it's been. Um, implemented into the programs and uh, accepted by the community here in Austin, Texas. Um, okay, Chris, uh, another question was rental energy codes. Could you elaborate on that idea? How do they work? Sure. Um, there are, are a couple of communities which, which have these in place, and, and the way they <clears throat> Uh, they can take different forms, but in, in Burlington, Vermont, for example, there is a code that, uh, requirement that says that if you are an owner of a rental, uh, a rental building, um, you cannot sell that building and get the deed of sale recorded unless you get it audited and can demonstrate that it meets minimum efficiency standards. Um, there's been... I, I believe there's now uh, recently a similar law passed in the city of Memphis, uh, Berkeley, California, and some other California communities have something similar. Um, these are essentially regulations um, that set minimum standards for the efficiency of rental buildings. And the trigger in, in, in some jurisdictions is the time of sale. Um, so it's not just a labeling requirement, but it's a, it goes beyond labeling requirements, the minimum efficiency requirement. Um, they might also, I believe in Memphis, so I'm not positive about this, someone would have to check. I believe in Memphis it, it's also, uh, the trigger may be different. It may be triggered by a uh, high, high bill complaint from a renter, and if it's, uh, if the assessment then demonstrates that your home or that your, the building that you're in doesn't meet certain efficiency requirements, the, the owner will be required to upgrade them. Um, it, it's, a, it's, it's an attempt to address the split incentives barrier between um, landlords and renters, which um, if done well, I think has the potential to, to do good things. If I can add a comment, the, the general sense that you address that split incentive mostly by legal requirements uh, is consistent with our experience. Uh, you can sing, dance, offer money, a whole bunch of things, but the, the, uh, uh, <laughs> the split incentive is pretty powerful uh, divide between uh, the cost of doing an energy efficiency uh, upgrade and the benefits. You kind of have to force the landlords to do it. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. um, any other any other questions, Mark? Um, there's a quick question on is the, is Charlottesville written up yet? Um, which I, guess, I, I suspect the answer is not yet because they're just doing it, but. I suspect the answer is not yet as well, um, although I can try uh, afterwards to find out if there's anything in, in writing that I can share with folks uh, and, and to follow up uh, as an attachment to an email that might go out to everyone who is on the line here. And the last question is uh, specific about TRC. Is TRC plus societal test comparable to the UCT? And, uh, and then TRC versus RIM issue. Has been prominent. 
So my, my but you can answer that, or you could say, why don't I do a general? Uh, well, your choice, Chris. You can either take it on, or you can write something to everybody. Um, sure, uh, I'll, I'll do. I'll take a. I'll do take a quick shot at, at the answer, and then um, and then maybe I'll also try to send out uh, the the paper that I referenced earlier, so that folks can who are interested can get into it more deeply. Um, the TRC slash societal test is it equi the question is it is it equivalent to the UCT is that the the question? Yes, I may have missed. Um, it. No, it's plus societal comparable. Um, no, it's it's a fundamentally different test. The um, <clears throat> uh, as noted earlier, the the TRC test compares the net present value of the benefits of efficiency, the, the energy savings, I should say, the, the energy saving benefits of efficiency to the total cost of the retrofit investment. So if you make a $10,000 investment in your home and the net present value of the gas and electricity savings are $9,000, you would fail the TRC test. <clears throat> um, the, the environmental, the societal cost test is the same thing except that typically that there's, you know, they may say the, you know, the carbon savings are worth an extra $2,000, so now it passes. The utility, con utility cost test in contrast, it, it looks at the same benefits as the TRC in the societal cost test, that is the, the net present value of the gas and electricity savings or, or oil if you're in a place where you heat with oil. However, the cost side of the equation is very different. Rather than looking at the total $10,000 investment the homeowner made, it, it tallies on the cost side only the portion of the investment that was made by the program. So if the program provided a $3,000 rebate on that $10,000 investment and then spent another $1,000 at home in fixed administrative costs, the cost side of the equation would only show $4,000. Um, and the idea there is you're, you're look, it's an app, more of an apples to apples comparison. The, the $4,000 is what the utility rate payers are investing and the whatever $9,000 in gas and electric savings benefits are what the utility rate payers are receiving in a benefit. Um, so it's a fundamentally different test. But again, I will forward on the, the, the paper to folks uh, or at least provide a link to, uh, to it um, as part of the follow on to this uh, webinar. Okay, now we have a, a structural issue here, which is as you key, as you're answering questions, more questions are coming in. So, yeah, and I should uh, probably stop at this point so that we can make sure that we have enough time for um, <coughs> for Mark and Tim to, to get to their presentations. And um, uh, and if we have more time at the end, we'll try to get to more of these questions. So, Mark, I'm going to hand the um, hand it over to you. Hand the baton over to me. Okay. Uh, Thank you. I'll, I'll uh, start off by saying on the California. There was one cal question on California, and uh, I would say in terms of comprehensive approaches, they are just starting, despite the long history of other programs. Anyway, um, so I'm going to see whether my control works by changing the slide to the next one, and it does with this interesting delay. Okay, what I'm going to be talking about is. Um, how one works with a contractor-based approach to comprehensive retrofits, what are some of the hybrids, and how to manage uh, a program which is built around contractors. Um, this kind of goes through my outline here. Uh, the reason I'm doing that is that uh, the uh, uh, contractor-based uh, approach is probably the most popular. Uh, approach that uh, most new programs that are approaching comprehensive retrofit are taking, uh, and it's often entered into uh, uh, naively <laughs> as to how difficult it is or how interesting it is to operate. Uh, Conservation Services Group is a nonprofit. Uh, I'll just give you a, a little ad at the beginning here. Um, we've got about 650 employees. Uh, we operate programs in a uh, number of states. We tend to be a turnkey program operation type outfit, and uh, we this is the the dark colors in each area are the place service territories that our programs handle. We do not actually claim to be operating everywhere. Um, in particular, on comprehensive uh, home retrofit programs, we uh, have 
in most cases from their inception, certainly for a long time, operated the home performance with Energy Star programs in New York, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Oregon. We've recently uh, taken uh, over operation of the program in Maine and started one up in Kentucky. And then we have comprehensive home retrofit programs, which do not qualify as home performance programs, but have very similar technical and uh, procedural approaches in some other states. Uh, and I, uh, I've been involved in managing these programs for about 20 years, even as the name uh, has changed, uh, both in these states and in the province of Quebec. So, uh, anyway, <laughs> that's the uh, that's the credential, uh, which means you might want to, you know, you can make your own judgment as to whether the rest of the slides are worth it. Um, when these programs were set up, the comprehensive approach was uh, treated through direct resource acquisition, where utilities primarily hired program vendors like uh, Conservation Services Group or Honeywell or ICF or any of the others uh, to implement the program, often with very low customer copayments uh, and uh, without a uh, bow towards uh, market transformation other than the fact that we were transforming people's houses. But the technology of comprehensively treating a home was developed in these programs and in the uh, low income weatherization program which had the same uh, goal but the, uh, uh, for a particular uh, income group. Uh, the contractor centric approach which is more popular now, um, a sponsor generally hires a program administrator to set up and manage the program but the program recruits contractors uh, who have certain qualifications, often BPI accreditation and certification. Uh, the contractors agree, and I'll go through this in a little more detail, to meet program standards, and there are rebates or other incentives that help the contractors sell uh, their services to the general public. Uh, the contract for the work is between the individual contractor and the homeowner or the building owner uh, and the sponsor uh, and the program administrator, for that matter, only show up sending the standards and providing the incentives. And you know, why would you want to do that? Um, at least from the outset, it looks like it's simpler to set up because you don't have to hire all the people to do the work or have direct contractual relationships with the contractors who implement things you get uh, what I call entrepreneurial vigor. Uh, every program tries to sell its services, but uh, contractors who are out there dependent on the sales and trying to make money uh, do it, uh, bring a um, uh, excitement, enthusiasm, uh, creativity to the sale that no public agency would ever bring. Uh, and I'll show you some examples. Uh, and, and on the flip side, the contractors who don't uh, bring this entrepreneurial vigor uh, don't live very long, or at least don't stay in the business, this business very long. Um, the, you create a market, as Chris has, has said, of uh, independent entrepreneurs and firms uh, who are excited about this and will continue to promote energy efficiency, and that translates into policy support. It is not uh, in states with uh, developing and mature uh, home performance contractor associations. It is not just the policy advocates and uh, the program managers and people like that who are arguing for a continuation of public support for energy efficiency. It is uh, 100 or 200 or 300 or 400 uh, small and medium-sized businesses with employees who are showing up looking remarkably like other interest groups except interested in promoting energy efficiency. Uh, and this is a big deal uh, if your programs are either trying to advance or trying to protect themselves. Uh, and I just I can, I can tell you many stories about each of these, but the, the basic idea is that when uh, uh, continued support, either regulatory or financial, for energy efficiency uh, programs is on the block, uh, you have an advocacy group which is much more focused than the uh, advocacy group of uh, potential or actual customers on uh, continuing things. Um, let's see. 
contractors, one of the things that happens in a mature industry is that the contractors pick up costs which otherwise the program has to pick up. Uh, for instance, you're always trying to advertise your program to uh, get people to participate. Uh, this is a, uh, a couple of years old ad from one of our larger contractors in New York. Uh, it's uh, got special offers on it that the contractor is offering on top of the incentives that the NYSERDA program provided, uh, and they're buying this. And uh, in some of our programs, we help them pay for it, but uh, instead of paying 100 cents on the dollar of advertising, uh, you're paying 25 cents because the contractors are paying it. Um, you should be aware of some of the disadvantages. The contractors are not program implementers. They are not, uh, in general, working for the program itself. They are working for themselves under the umbrella of the program. They like high prices. And the conversation about TRC, uh, as I'll say later on, they're not interested <laughs> in that. They're interested in charging what they can get uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the product. Um, they also sell what they make money on. Uh, so you end up with a somewhat of a policing function. Uh, we've had one contractor submit uh, for rebate a um, regrading of a driveway as an Energy Star measure, which was hard to find. Uh, and it actually had some home performance logic, uh, which is that it kept the water away from the basement, but it was not a rebateable item. And if you're going through 100 or 200 of these a week, catching those is uh, tricky. And then uh, there's entrepreneurial vigor comes in uh, easy to absorb forms like the one I showed you before, and uh, somewhat less uh, easy to absorb forms. Um, this is another couple of years old ad from another large contractor in New York, which uh, I don't think any public or private utility sponsor in the United States or Canada, to my knowledge, would ever uh, print. Um, and this isn't uh, the most extreme. Uh, the most successful contractors have often been people who used to sell siding and uh, have the ethics to prove it. So it's an, an interesting uh, challenge in running these things. Um, the biggest problem with building your, your program around contractors is that you have time limits and you have cost effectiveness requirements. And the contractors have their own time limits, uh, i.e. they want to make money this week because they're generally meeting weekly payroll. Uh, and they may be worried about low price competitors, or they maybe have stockholder expectations if they're a large firm, but they are absolutely not interested, unless you make them interested, in completing work by December 31st or by December 15th so the paperwork can be in by January 5th, uh, all of which are key program issues. Uh, and they certainly don't care about the overall cost uh, of the project uh, uh, that they're selling to customers. Uh, in fact, they rather prefer larger costs if the customers are willing to pay for them. So as you set up a contractor-centric operation, you have to realize that you are harnessing them, you, you are working with them, hopefully, to achieve a public purpose, but they are not primarily driven by the public purpose that, uh, that motivates you or uh, puts you into the field. Um, one of the things that happens well, let me see. Um, one of the things that happens uh, with this is that uh, contractors, I, I'm a little nervous because this is supposed to be an animated slide and I'm seeing all three graphs at once. So if somebody who's, somebody send me a note, see whether you're seeing one graph or three. It's one graph, Mark. Okay. So the, the original plan usually with a program is that uh, you get a nice production line like that, a red line, right? One graph, three lines, okay. So the, the initial thing is you say, everybody says, we, you know, it's a three-year program, we're going to produce, you know, divide three years by, uh, you know, by 12 quarters, and that'll be the production. And then they sit down with a program designed uh, firm like uh, Chris's or implementers like us, and we say, no, no, there's a ramp-up period. So you end up with a green line uh, like that, which says, well, we'll start slow and then we'll get up there. Reality tends to look like the blue line there, which is uh, the contractors get recruited and trained and start doing work, and customers take months to decide on whether to do the work. And from the point of view of the program, nothing happens 
in the first one month, two months, three months, sometimes six, seven months, in the sense of nothing happens in the, in the terms of projects completed. And money is being spent as if you were on the red line uh, and work is coming in on the blue. And then at some point, if the program is working, things to start to take off. And from the point of view of a program manager, completions show up. Uh, in the office, and uh, you get to verify them and go out and inspect them, and all of a sudden there's consumption savings on the board, which is what you're getting paid for, but not what the contractors are getting paid for. It. The, the period between of the gap between the red line and the blue line uh, is one that calls for faith, uh, and uh, <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> faith <laughs> on both parties. Uh, and it's a it's a tough period if you go through, and if it stretches to a year and a half. Uh, sometimes uh, regulators get cranky. So you have to prepare people for this and realize that that's part of the name of the game. This is an actual production uh, chart by contractor uh, for the NYSERDA program for the first four years. And you can pretty much inscribe the S on that. Uh, and every, every program that we've managed uh, that, rely, that is built on contractor uh, contractor-driven uh, activity looks something like this. If I superimpose the marketing spending and the development spending on this line, it would come in at around the 700 level and stay flat and then tar start to drop off in year three as production increase. So you end up with a, uh, you just have to realize that your marketing and your program product development comes well before uh, production in this type of program. This is summarized. Contractor reality is a lot slower than your reality. And you really have to adjust for that in the expectation of the sponsors. And um, I think you know there are ways to speed it up, and I'll get into them. But uh, everybody should understand that this is not the same as putting a rebate on the street where next week somebody will send in the rebate form and you'll be able to claim savings. Uh, it takes a while to get the contractors into the field. It takes a while for customers to decide to do these comprehensive work this comprehensive work and that the word of mouth advertising this is the key thing takes longer than that because you need a significant number of people in a concentrated area to um, talk to each other about what a good time they had doing this work before things start to take off. The main reason that people go to what, I, what we call hybrid programs is this issue about uh, trying to get some production on the board more quickly uh, than the market itself will take. Um, and the main hybrids are the ones I described here. A lot of times programs are going uh, to either pay for the audit, uh, to hire contractors or hire a firm like CSG to actually do the initial audit and do the initial sale or what I would call a near sale, something that uh, uh, you know the customer has almost but not quite bought the service and then the contractor comes in and closes the deal. And in several programs, people, the sponsors have decided to pay for directly air sealing and duct sealing, which are in some, sense, in some ways the most cost-effective things that can be done in you know, high heating and high cooling climates, and the things which are most foreign to the contractor network, which they have the most trouble selling and pricing. Um, if you're going to go to contract, uh, uh, a contractor-based model, you may start with a hybrid and then as the market gets going, ease out the uh, sort of directly paid for audits or air sealing and ease contractors into it. And from a program management point of view, uh, what we've tended to describe to sponsors recently is that as the program grows, our auditors will become quality assurance inspectors and the contractors will take over doing the new uh, auditing and air sealing work. Uh, as the market matures nationwide, there may be less need of these, and I'll sort of talk about how that's developing a bit further down the line. Um, in general, the contractor network, as, as Chris has described, for comprehensive uh, energy efficiency, uh, building science-driven work is pretty weak. Um, the, that is, if you, you know, the Look in what used to be the yellow pages for home comprehensive home energy assessments and, and treatments, and you won't find anybody. Um, 
the specialized trades, the more we are building into building science, the harder it is to find people. Um, and as Chris has described a lot of this. Uh, this used to be universally true. I mean, there was at one, at one point, CSG managed programs included something like 90% of all the people in the country who had BPI certifications, which was kind of fun from our point of view, but didn't indicate a mature market. That's no longer true. Uh, especially in the last two years, between federal stimulus money going for low-income weatherization and for market transformation programs, uh, the Homestar program, which did not pass, but everybody was talking about, uh, lots and lots of contractors and individuals have gotten into the industry or are trying to get in. Uh, BPI has been swamped by uh, people wanting uh, training and getting it, getting certified. Uh, a couple of Several large national firms are now showing up. Uh, uh, I list them here so I don't have to read it off. Uh, but uh, I guess from our perspective, the, the Lowe's, Home Depot, and Sears uh, experiments are beginning to uh, get into the industry uh, things, phenomena that we see in, in several places, uh, have the potential of changing what you face when you start up a program. You, in, historically, you start a program, the program is setting the standards, contractors have never heard of them before, and you have to set up an entire training apparatus to feed people into BPI or to uh, NAID or whoever certification you want to use. Uh, that is a whole lot less true this year than it was two years ago. Uh, and I think we, uh, with continued interest in energy uh, retrofit, uh, it is likely to be easier to get started over the next couple of years than it has been over the last couple. Um, nonetheless, <laughs> you have to have a recruiting plan. Uh, in general, I, I don't know, there, there, there are probably more creative ways to do it than we have either done or seen, but we use direct mail. <laughs> we, in general, utilities who are involved have a preferred contractor network. You call them or email them or write them. Uh, you have our, most of our programs will have an account manager or you have a program manager do this, and you go meet contractors often at the point, the distributors uh, of their equipment, uh, you know, in uh, coffee and carbs, right, you know, donuts at the beginning of the day to talk about what the program is, and you need to be able to explain to contractors why this is good for them. Uh, all of our programs and all the programs I know of that other people operate tend to start off looking at contractors who are excited about building science or already got involved in it. Um, in our experience, it is actually much easier to find people, contractors who are good at selling stuff, selling home repairs or home improvements to homeowners and teach them about building science than it is to teach uh, our uh, best friends who are the building science uh, techie whizzes uh, how to sell. Uh, and there are a few exceptions to that, but if I'm designing a program, I'd say go go find a uh, uh, siding or window salesman who wants to convert to something he feels good about at night uh, rather than trying to find somebody who's uh, already got, uh, who built their own blower door uh, four years ago uh, and uh, can tell you all the air movements in the house uh, but hasn't sold anything. Um, the deal that you offer to contractors is an exchange of services, if you will. The sponsor wants contractors to do things they're not doing, which I've listed here. <laughs> Sell these new services, be subject to independent quality assurance, provide good quality customer service in a way that uh, generally the program demands, um, and properly rent represent the program, i.e., which includes not overpromising what the savings are going to be, which is really hard for contractors. Uh, and the sponsor has to provide some support. Incentives are the obvious ones, marketing support, some way to distinguish the contractors who are in from the contractors who are out. I mean, we tend to use the BPI certification and accreditation label as the distinguisher, uh, but you can have your own participation agreement. Uh, contractors, our contractors who are in the program want to make money and they want to recover their investments. Uh, it means you have to distinguish between work done by participating contractors and other people's work, and you have to kick people out if they are violating the norms. Otherwise, you're breaking your deal with the contractors, 
and they will uh, retaliate by going off and doing their own work and not helping you. And uh, the last point about treating contractors as partners is uh, is critical. Uh, they are investing their time and their money, and most of them don't have that much, on the assumption that you're describing a program which will be around long enough for them to make some money off working in it. Uh, and changing the terms, uh, uh, changing the incentive structure, changing the technical requirements without advance notice is a uh, it's sort of a breach of faith, and you have to you have to do that. <laughs> Sometimes you have to do that, but it should be really important when you do it. And our practice is to give people three to six months notice of major changes, if at all possible. Uh, and also to listen to them when they tell you that the change won't work. Try and uh, accommodate their uh, insights because, uh, after all, they're the ones out in the street or on the, in the kitchens uh, selling the services that you want people to adopt. Um, in general, contractors need to be trained in how to do comprehensive energy audits. Everybody needs to know how the program is going to work, and that's a training requirement that you can generally do in a day with people, but not a lot less. Air sealing and duct sealing are pretty surprisingly unknown in the industry. Proper sizing of HVAC equipment, which you would think everybody would know in the industry if you haven't talked to them, is wildly unknown. Uh, we've gravitated towards the BPI standards because uh, they are comprehensive uh, in line with the building science as we understand it and have a field test as well as a uh, written test. Uh, so at least, you know, on one day, at least on one day, the contractor was able to uh, do the work that you expect them to do uh, meeting uh, viable technical standards. And that's, uh, that doesn't substitute for a quality assurance program, but at least it gets you started properly. Um, on the non-technical side, many of the contractors who come into these programs and succeed are adding staff, adding a second or a fourth or a tenth crew. Um, they are almost all being uh, required to report on things to us to, or to the program sponsor uh, that they've never had to report to anybody on. Uh, adding administrative staff is a, is a huge change for these folks uh, in many cases, and a lot of our programs uh, undervalue uh, the importance of this kind of non-technical training. Um, we are increasingly encouraging programs to link up with community colleges or other training sites where, who offer general business training. Um, we and other people who are in the business often provide marketing training, and as Chris has said, uh, most of these contractors, many of them are not terribly good at sales. Uh, and uh, training people in the technical side of how to do an audit is uh, almost, I don't know that it's half the game. It's certainly something around half the game. The other half is how to turn an audit and a set of recommendations into a proposal that a customer can accept and hopefully accept uh, right there or after consultation with their spouse within a week because the, um, you know, Rather quickly after the audit is done, people are off to something else if they haven't decided to go forward. Incentives. Every program uh, that succeeds <laughs> has incentive, significant incentives. And generally these are, you start off saying what we're going to do is reduce the cost of buying the energy efficiency uh, retrofit for the customer. Uh, our experience is that you need these three kinds. Uh, you need some capacity incentives to help contractors, especially at the beginning of a program, help them pay for the equipment and the training and the certifications that we're requiring. Uh, you need some ongoing production incentives to the contractor, which encourage the contractors to market their services and to report them to the program. Um, that last reporting them to the program may sound obvious. Uh, why wouldn't they report it to the program? Well, if they don't if they, the contractor, don't get any of the incentives, on some level they do their installation, they get paid, they go away. The customer gets to file the paperwork to get the incentive, and whether the, and the contractor, especially the short-sighted ones, uh, don't care whether that happens. And you'd be surprised how many programs run for a while and realize nobody, it's not that nothing's going on, it's just the contractors aren't telling them about it. 
And finally, the incentive that everybody knows about, which is that you want to have some incentives to encourage contract customers to uh, buy these services now. Um, I'll go through them in some, uh, hopefully not too much detail. Um, I've described what this is. The general idea of a capacity incentive is that they are asked to get training, to buy equipment, get certifications, they the contractors, and our experience is you offer to refund some of that cost to them after they have done their first job or their fifth job or some other job within the program. So it means that for the contractors who, are, who can put up the money to get into the game, they get some of it back as they get started. Um, a lot of programs looking for a quick start say, oh, we'll give this, this equipment away or we'll give the training away. You end up with what we call a lot of hobbyists, people who come in because this is really interesting. Uh, and sometimes they want to get equipment, but they don't actually have a business plan or uh, a serious approach about getting, uh, getting work done. And after all, it is the insulation, the air sailing, the new uh, heating or cooling systems, the other retrofits that produce energy savings, not the audits or the training of contractors. So you want to link your incentives to production, and this is the best technique we found for doing it. Um, these are typical incentives. Uh, a, higher, a higher percentage of the uh, cost of training, because contractors aren't used to paying for training, they get to keep the equipment, so we've got lower cost on that. Um, I can't. Uh, th these are uh, uh, pretty standard ones from the CSG point of view, but uh, uh, I have no scientific proof that this is the best percentage. The general concept, the contractor pays first. When they do production, they get a certain percentage back. Uh, is has been pretty uh, attractive to contractors. And in some programs, as uh, in if incentives go up sharply or production takes off uh, on its own, you can reduce these. And the, the way to tell is when the contractors start banging on your door uh, saying they want in then you can probably reduce the incentives for getting them in. Uh, we generally have a small incentive per audit done. This is primarily uh, to get the contractor to tell us that they did an audit so we can build a pipeline report for our, our sponsors. Um, and there's some other benefits for doing it as well. But that's that, when we run programs without this, you get into this kind of odd situation if they're not, you don't know what's going on. Um, Co-op marketing incentive is a portion of the marketing projects that they do. Um, what it it does two things. One is it tells the contractors you really ought to be marketing, and no, we're not going to provide you all your customers. Uh, and the second thing it does is it gives you a method of sitting down with the contractors to talk about what they're marketing, uh, and uh, to enforce the idea that they don't misrepresent the program, which again is or or even represented in a way which is accurate but embarrassing. Um, which happens surprisingly often. We generally put this at around 25% of the cost of a marketing campaign with a cap and the possibility of raising the cap if the contractor is producing a lot of uh, work with high quality uh, results. Um, cu customer incentives are uh, what everybody understands when they set up these programs you ought to have. Um, we have been working with and others have to uh, sort of modifications of incentives to encourage deep retrofits or uh, we're starting with some to look at encouraging people to do things over a number of years. Um, the flip side of that is since we have goals, and <laughs> we have production goals by year. Contractors don't, uh, neither do customers particularly, but uh, we got to get refunded and so do you. So one of the things we've done is have what, what amount to sales, end of the year sales. Get your get your energy efficiency work done by Labor Day, or by you know December 15th, and we'll give you extra money. Um, this is entirely uh, designed. Well, it's, it's got two purposes. One is to create some excitement in the market, and the other is to get uh, reporting in so that the program uh, meets its annual goals. Um, the incentives have to be, in, in our view, have to be available only to contractors who are participating in meeting quality standards in the program so that they are out in the market probably charging a bit more than their competitors but have these incentives to help offset that increase. Um, 
we haven't mentioned this before, but a lot of places now have uh, what I'm calling a multi-sponsor environment. In, in, in some parts of New York uh, right now, the same activity, insulating the house, could get an incentive from as many as three different sponsors, uh, and they're all different. So um, figuring out how to negotiate <laughs> this and uh, arranging uh, to have this, the incentives build upon each other rather than compete uh, is, I, I think, a, it's a challenge that we face. And I think in uh, in any state where you've got uh, some state-mandated programs through utilities and ARA-funded projects uh, in on a municipal basis, um, you're likely to run into this. It's a longer discussion, but it's worth talking about how to how to make that into a win as opposed to lose situation. Um, in general, sponsors like to send rebates to the customer. Uh, everybody understands this one. It's like the coupon at the supermarket, and uh, and that's the most common thing. The the difficulty with it is it it disconnects the contractor from the process. Uh, I.e., they complete their work, they get paid, they go away. The customer has to gather the paperwork, whatever you're requiring, send it in, and get their money back someday. Uh, whenever we get around, or the sponsor, or whoever gets around to paying it, uh, we tend to prefer things where the contractor uh, gives the customer the rebate at the time of the sale, and uh, what we call an instant rebate, and uh, it identifies it as a separate item on the invoice, gathers up the information, and we pay and we pay the contractor uh, for this work uh, after a while. It it, it really uh, cuts the lag time in contractors reporting what they've done. Um, and uh, in general, it improves program administration. It's just counterintuitive to almost everybody in the process. And some of the contractors have started to say, we don't like this because then they're the ones stuck waiting while we process their work uh, and uh, get them their money. Uh, that argues pretty strongly uh, for making sure your payment process is quick and effective. Um, here are a couple of incentive types, customer incentive types that work. Uh, this is the most standard that's up on the board now, a rebate for a uh, particular measure uh, with a particular qualification. Um, one of the modifications that people have done is they'll say, if you get a high sear air conditioner, uh, we'll give you $250 towards it. If you get it installed by a BPI certified contractor, we'll give you $500 towards it as a as a, a leg up for the qualified contractors. Um, there can be comprehensiveness bonuses, which we've uh, done and other people have done in a couple of places where uh, we give you, ex if you do several things, an efficient furnace and attic insulation and air sailing, uh, you can get more by doing them all together than you, uh, as a rebate than you can by uh, uh, doing them separately. What this does, and the whole, and you'll see many of these things are designed to encourage contractors to sell more comprehensive jobs to give them a tool for closing that sale. Uh, low interest loans, as, as Chris has said, are the, uh, the the drug of choice at the moment. Everybody thinks the, these things, low interest loans, are going to solve. Uh, uh, problems. What what happened in NYSERDA when we set up the program in 2000 and 2001 was the only incentive available was a low interest loan. And uh, after about a year and a half of operating the program, we discovered that we were capturing something around half of the jobs that our contractors were doing. Because if the customer had enough money to pay for it themselves and weren't taking the loan, and the loan was 5% loan at the time, nobody would tell us about it. Introducing a cash back amount, which was lower than the cost of buying down the loan to 5%, uh, doubled production in a matter of months of production that we could see, um, and uh, really uh, improved the contractor's use of the loan uh, as, a, as a means of getting people into the program. Uh, one of the things you can do with a loan is to set up a loading order and this is true of other measures, other approaches as well, 
but uh, I mean, one of the problems with co these programs is that the most popular thing that contractors sell is new windows, even though on a dollar-for-dollar -dollar basis, it's almost always the least cost-effective thing that a customer can do. So we've tended to put in restrictions about when you can put windows in the project, only if you do a whole bunch of other things. Uh, a loading order uh, is helpful, and there are a number of examples of this that people can go through or we can provide. The third type, uh, which is I think increasingly popular in the more comp in the programs that are more dedicated to comprehensive work, is to have incentives that are linked to projected savings. If you've got a comprehensive uh, audit software that you trust that is projecting the savings, you can set up the incentives so that the more you save, the higher incentive you get. We tend to prefer a couple of steps rather than a gradual. Uh, thing because it helps the contractors sit down at the kitchen table and say, well, if you could do this and this much more, you could get this higher incentive. And it tends to, it's actually quite effective at boosting the projected savings per house treated and the comprehensiveness of the jobs done. Um, you have to have common energy modeling software and a tight quality assurance system, otherwise people will make up uh, all the numbers and you'll be incentivizing uh, work that wasn't done properly. But uh, but with that, I think you can achieve this, and we've seen some pretty uh, strikingly good results of getting, um, I think, 35 or 40 percent of the homes treated in the main program to do thermal measures, which at least by our software will save 50 percent of the cost of uh, heating energy in the home, uh, which is sort of way outside the bounds of what we thought would happen when we introduced the incentive. But the contractors got creative and aggressive and you know, convinced people to insulate these surprisingly uninsulated main homes and put in efficient boilers and furnaces and achieve the results. Um, Chris said uh, comprehensive treatments are five to 10,000. I would push that number up, <laughs> five to 20, sometimes higher for larger homes. Uh, it's a big ticket item for almost everybody. Uh, having low interest loans available uh, is a real market maker. Um, It's also surprising how few, how often people don't use them. Uh, they're not a magic bullet. Uh, in most of our programs, the people using program loans are under, are, are a third or under of participants, uh, because uh, American homeowners have a lot of access to capital, even in these tough markets. Uh, and uh, we've learned this. We've learned this in enough places that we stopped trying to learn it, and we just assume that the loans are an important part of things. They help contractors close deals, but they're not going to be uh, the main way that people pay for these things. People pay for them out of lines of credit or out of savings or out of other things, uh, other loans that we don't know about. Um, and loans by themselves do not build the contractor network, do not tell people about the new service, do not provide quality insurance. Uh, do not provide training to contractors, and do not provide the go do it now effect of cash incentives uh, that uh, exist in most successful programs. Uh, this is a list of some of the elements, and I think I've mentioned all of them before, but sort of putting them together uh, on a slide. And I, I stole this from Chris, so it's, it's almost certainly true. Um, We've got marketing, we've got to do assessments, rebates, we have to offer financing. My sense is you have to offer both <laughs> rebates and financing and figure out a way to mix them. You need some central place where people can find out about things. You need the contractors uh, to be on the team and you have to get them there and provide training. You have to find some means of distinguishing them from non-qualified contractors. We use BPI certification. You have to provide technical support to contractors. Even with their training, they're going to run into houses where they really ought to be calling up somebody who's more expert than they to figure out what to do about them. And the quality control inspections, um, as I've said about certification, certification tells you that on one day, that crew from that contractor knew how to do the work right. Quality control inspections means that, at least in a sample of things, you know they actually did it right many times. And uh, the two help each other, but they're not substitutes. When you're managing a program, you've got to provide 
all of these services. Uh, I'll emphasize complaint procedures. This is a pub in some way publicly or utility-sponsored program. Customers assume uh, correctly that the sponsor stands behind the work of the contractors, uh, and uh, you have to be prepared for complaints to come in. Complaints may be serious of the contractor not doing the work properly. You will get complaints about the color of the caulk that was used uh, as well, uh, which uh, in our experience actually has no effect on the energy saving, but uh, it may be a big deal for a particular project. Uh, and there is a certain amount of management that's required even in minimal programs. Um, how much one spends on these things can be <coughs> adjusted, but leaving them out leaves you open to trouble. Uh, a number of these services are provided by contractor implementation contractors like ourselves. Uh, there are training specialists who can help out with the training. We strongly recommend using BPI uh, for certification and for accreditation of the firms, but uh, we have and other people, you can certainly develop your own certifications um, you know that require that and testing procedures and many, many uh, contract uh, systems use their rather than accrediting the firm through BPI requiring that they set up uh, a participation agreement which has the same function make sure that the contractor will uh, do what the program wants quality assurance uh, random uh, inspections of work being done uh, are absolutely critical to maintaining quality of the programs as they're delivered and uh, and the contractors may resist them, insist on that. There's really no substitute that I know of. Um, the other services are pretty obvious. A lot of these things you can develop on your own, and a lot of them can now be provided by contractors who are, are implementation folks who are still or are in the field already. Um, this is Chris has gone through some of these, and following Chris is always tricky because he. Uh, he's very comprehensive. Let me just say a few things. This isn't so. This may look simple from a distance. I hope I've disabused you of that. It's not so simple. You need. Uh, it's a good program for slow results. It is not a good program for quick results. If your goal is to save a whole lot of energy, and I've had people call me, you know, call me in September and say we want to set up one of these home performance programs. We've got to get some savings on the board by uh, December of this year. I say. Do another design. Don't even go into the conversation. It takes a while to get these things program these programs going. Training contractors uh, is not nearly enough. Um, I used to call them catch and release programs, where you'd get contractors in, tell them about the business opportunity, train them how to do it, and then let them loose on their own. And five months later, have no work done and no contractors left. Uh, I've beaten the certified <laughs> the quality assurance and top of certification. Uh, hard enough already, so I won't say it again. Um, this is one of my favorites. Home energy retrofits are such a good idea that they sell themselves. Um, people sell chocolate. Uh, people sell Cialis. Uh, people sell perfume. There are lots of things which are good ideas, fun, or even addictive that other people sell. Uh, home energy retrofits are none of those things. They're just good for you. So the idea that they're going to sell themselves uh, is uh, is a fantasy. Uh, they have to be sold. Somebody in the chain, and hopefully the contractor, has to be good at selling. Uh, and otherwise, the products will not move uh, off the trucks and into people's homes themselves. Uh, that, I think, has been proven. <laughs> and if you want to prove it again, uh, you can do that, but I, I would suggest taking on the idea that a sales effort and marketing effort is critical to this as a given. And the last thing is kind of a, uh, obscure, but I'll, I, and I've said it a couple times. If your goal is to reduce TRC, the contractor model is a problem because the contractors want to sell at the maximum price that the market will bear, not the minimum price uh, that uh, you could uh, that a that a highly competitive uh, uh, auction of these services would provide, which is typically where the TRC stuff goes. Um, the contractor model builds in profits 
uh, it, you get the entrepreneurial vigor and excitement and uh, uh, drive that they bring to it, but it comes at a price. The price is paid by willing customers, and your incentives are designed to encourage people to use it. But uh, uh, there are cheaper ways to get this done if you're buying in bulk. Uh, they're just not as good, and they're not as uh, likely to sustain themselves. So that's, I believe, what I have to say on this topic. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, uh, I saw three questions uh, come in, and we don't have a lot of time, but I think we have time for at least these three. Um, the, the first one was uh, a question about whether there are the con contractor-centric approach um, has been applied or used in contexts where there's unregulated suppliers, that is, um, unregulated energy suppliers. That is, are there, are there any jurisdictions in which that you're aware of where the, uh, an entity which is selling gas or electricity is, is also um, bundling that sale with, uh, as, as, a, as a part of a larger product um, with retrofit efficiency improvements? I'm not aware of it functioning just that way. Um, the, there are several places where uh, gas utility service divisions are uh, selling comprehensive services, um, you know, under a regulated in, in a sort of regulated, non-regulated environment. Uh, we have some uh, examples of oil and propane dealers who are bundling. Uh, energy efficiency services in a comprehensive program with their own oil and gas, you know, propane mm -hmm. sales. Um, this is pretty rare in my experience. Uh, I, I, I would agree. I, I could think of some similar examples, but uh, but I would agree they're they're rare. Um, okay. So the the second one was. Uh, the second question was, um, you know, maybe elaborating a little bit more about how you can ensure, uh, or even if not ensure, you know, what are the top three things you could do to encourage as deep a treatment as possible of the efficiency opportunities in a home? The, I guess the, I, I'd say there are uh, three, there are a couple of places to do it. One is, um, if you are doing whatever public education you're doing about this opportunity, whether it's you know public uh, public relations efforts, uh, speaking at the library, or paid media advertising on a massive scale, or anything in between, uh, explaining to the public that comprehensive treatment is a good idea and what it means is very important. This is not known uh, very widely. So people have to be aware of it. Uh, the second thing is uh, emphasizing this issue in your training of contractors and how to participate. And thirdly, and perhaps the most powerful, is to rig the uh, rig, rig is pejorative way to set up the incentives so that it is easy for the contractor to sell more comprehensive work and attract it to them. That the incentives go up as the comprehensiveness goes up. And I provided a couple examples of that. Um, so far, the best, the most successful ones are this: what I sort of the super incentive or bonus incentive. If you get, you know, if you if you do the furnace, you get this. If you do the air sealing and the insulation, you get this. And if you do both together at the same time, you get what we already offered you. Plus, if you act now, you know, an extra five hundred dollars or some nice round, uh, exciting number. Uh, that works and has sort of increased comprehensive results. And the other is to have something that is based off a you know a common audit platform that is literally based to the percentage savings uh, projected, with a, a nice uh, again visible kind of exciting jump if you hit a certain level of uh, savings. Uh, we tend to prefer round numbers where the last where the the incentive is three digits. Or more, and the last two are zeros. Uh, I, I agree with all those, especially the last one. And the, the only thing I would I would add uh, is that, and Mark and I have started talking about this a, a little bit ourselves. Is um, 
we, we might want to be thinking in these programs about uh, as part of the assessment that's done of the home and the efficiency opportunity, uh, providing some sort of long-term plan or a roadmap on what the home could or should do to get to a comprehensive treatment over time, even if the homeowner is not prepared to go whole hog um, right at the beginning. But, uh, but at least that, that's a vehicle through which the, the homeowner might be educated um, through some sort of leap behind. <coughs> Uh, and it could also serve as a, um, uh, an excuse for the contractor who does the first chunk of work on the plan yeah. um, to back. call the customer back. Yeah, I mean, one way to do that with this, with this plan I described, these sort of super bonus, is to say, okay, you want to insulate the house now. Well, this furnace is going to last another couple of years. Or, you know, another, if you can replace that, if you can, get around, if you can replace the furnace in the next 24 months, I can give you the furnace incentive and the bonus. You know, something to increase the urgency of doing the comprehensive work, essentially the same, the same process but allowing it to be spread out over time as opposed to having it to be a single transaction. Uh, mm -hmm. That requires tracking and it requires a contractor with a long-term perspective, you know, a, a Green Homes or a Masco or, you know, a Sears, somebody who is more likely to be able to track people, but also contractors who are kind of used to the service side of this and just want to maintain a customer base. I mean, I've always thought that an oil dealer or a, uh, you know, a, an oil dealer or a propane dealer, somebody who's got recurring business with the same customer uh, would find that approach attractive. Uh, we've done some experiments. Um, I, can't, uh, I can't say that it works yet, but it seems to me it's certainly worth trying. Uh, okay, and the, the, last, uh, the last question is, um, uh, for now, um, is uh, somebody noted that, uh, you know, one of the clear messages, I think, from the first two presentations, and I think it'll be echoed in Tim's presentation to follow, is that, um, you know, one of the key messages here is that for these things to be successful, they have to be long-lived. Um, there has to be some consistency to these programs, and, and the vision that you, you bring to them has to be a long-term vision. Um, and our, the, the, so the question was, it seems like, uh, unfortunately, in many jurisdictions, programs tend to be on again, off again, which, which is a barrier. Are there examples of programs other than Texas, other than Austin's, um, which are uh, long-lived? Yeah. I, I can think of a few, but I think you probably could think of even well, more than I, I can, think, Mark. I mean, Vermont has been long-lived. Massachusetts, which is sort of a uh, mixture of a direct procurement and contractor model. Uh, has been pretty consistent. Mean, we're changing it this year, but we've had about 12 years of commonality. The NYSERDA program, uh, NYSERDA was acutely aware of the need for continuity when they set it up, and while there have been many small program changes, broadly the program that we set up in 2000 and 2001 is still operating. Um, Oregon has a pretty decent uh, long-term history. Uh, as well, and uh, a lot of the others are newer. Uh, Chris, you may have some other examples. Yeah, the only other example I could think of of one that's been out for you know five, six years or longer is Wisconsin's. Okay. Uh, but it, but it is the, the point that changing radical changes, disruptions, uh, and we've tried both of those in a couple of places, um, are not a good idea. <laughs> you know, you really, you lose, you're breaking faith with, uh, in effect, with you know, several hundred contractors who are redesigning their lives uh, around uh, a premise about how the program is going to run. Um, interestingly enough, incentive changes, at least uh, moderate ones, don't act that way. If you let people know they're coming, um, people can adapt. And the incentives are, are tend to be um, – the icing on the cake of the sale as opposed to the driver of the sale itself. Uh, stopping the program, radically changing the technical standards uh, uh, in any direction um, are, are very, very disruptive and you really want to bend over backwards to avoid that. Okay, thanks, thanks, Mark. I think we need to stop. There's a couple other questions that have come in, but I think we need to make sure we've saved enough time for Tim's presentation. Um, so if we have time at the end, we can come back to the other questions. I've, I've made a note of them. Um, so I'm going to pull Tim's uh, uh, presentation up here.
Okay, and, I'm um, to myself. There you go. And um, I will note that one of the questions is what was what is this PowerPoint or these PowerPoint presentations going to be made available? Um, and and I, I think I noted in the introduction that they, they will be, at, and not only will the presentations, the PowerPoints be made available on RAP's website, and we'll send you an email to show you how to get there, um, but this present, these presentations, the, the verbal part of it is also being recorded, and um, the, that recording will also be made available. So Tim, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you very much, Chris, for the opportunity to join in with this conversation. Um, Chris came to me, I guess, about a month ago asking uh, for Austin's story on what we're doing with Home Performance Energy Star and also with our demand side management programs moving forward and how we're tying it together with the disclosure ordinance that was just passed back in uh, 2008 here in Austin, Texas. This slide here, uh, again, I'm, this is what I'm going to cover. I'm going to get into you know, Austin Energy's profile. I'm going to talk a little bit about our home performance programs. Also get into the Energy Conservation Disclosure Ordinance, which is now a city code here in Austin, Texas, what it is and what, what's included. And at the end, we should have enough time, hopefully, for Q&A, and if not, definitely be available for, for email exchanges or phone messages uh, with, with folks. So a little bit about Austin. As Chris mentioned, uh, Austin is the 10th largest municipal utility in the United States. It's also home of the state capital uh, for Texas. Also home of a couple universities, uh, colleges, technical schools. But our service area is generally about 400 square miles. Population right under a million people in the greater Austin area, uh, which goes into the outskirts also of Austin. And the primary reason I guess we're we're talking about demand side management programs and um, whole house retrofits and designing and implementing, Austin's been on this radar for a long time, as you can see, for 28 years promoting energy efficiency. So since 1982, we've we've started with that whole house approach, initially starting like uh, Chris and them had mentioned with a low interest loan, which evolved into a rebate program. But the core the core success of of the program, which takes us to where we are today is having that core group of contractors, having them prepared for the marketplace, and that's four to five local contractors that help move through that initial years of implementing these type of program services. And unfortunately enough, these folks are still with us, but we're kind of, we're in a little different position because these folks are starting to retire and get out of the in industry now. <laughs> so Austin's a little bit different position uh, when it comes to um, the marketplace and how it was prepared and, and the contractors and how they're evolving and how they're now starting to move out. And so we have new contractors we're preparing for. I'll get into that on a couple other slides as, as we move forward. But our energy improvements, the way the program started, we're looking at high energy efficiency. When 10 SEER air conditioning equipment was, was considered the baseline um, for, for energy efficiency, now again we're up to the, the 13 SEER with the national uh, level. Uh, our program guidelines all start about 14 SEER, and those are seasonal seasonal energy efficiency rating or ratios uh, that are there that are rating on the type of equipment. So through the years, again, we, we did experience, since the exception, uh, energy savings and demand savings that have allowed the utility to actually move forward with taking a major power plant off the city's grid, which is Holly Power, the Holly Power Plant, back in 1994, that was really successful, and that was really coined idea of the virtual energy power plant. Sorry, the slides are a little delayed, but Austin Energy uh, here, we've been really successful, like NYSERDA, um in putting our best foot forward with. Um, tapping into the uh, to Environmental Protection Agency's um, Energy Star program. And when we won the award in 19, in, excuse me, in 2006 as Partner of the, of the Year, it gave us an opportunity to rebrand the program to our local community and gave our contractors a sense of uh, belonging to a bigger uh, initiative here, and not only here locally doing the local work, but also at the national level, something they could recognize, tacking, uh, uh, tagging on to the, the Home Performance Energy Star name there. And we see, we felt a lot of experience. We felt the feedback we got from our contractors and pro home performance companies uh, were definitely on track with that type of experience and, uh, and feeling they had another conversation to have with that customer when they were out promoting these our program services. 
So one of the slides that Chris had earlier was looking at uh, Austin Energy's per, uh, participation, and this is primarily our home performance Energy Star participation numbers going from 05 to 2009. And you can see a steady trend up, uh, going from 1,300 to 1,700 to 1,900 to 2,400 to 2,600 homes. Um, but again, what we're, I mean, we, we survey our customers on a regular basis, and we're very, very excited about these energy efficiency opportunities. But the, uh, uh, I guess one of the things I wanted to leave on this slide was that the federal tax credit credits and then the state tax credits, along with our Austin Energy incentives, have, have helped us move through the success where we are today. And I guess we got good news from the federal level that there's possibly, a, um, there's possibly tax credits that are going to come back through a bill that, um, that's, that's being uh, talked about right now at the feds level. Next slide. So the customer incentives and what we did, uh, developed here in Austin, Texas, the Home Performance Energy Star program, the idea was to try to reduce the cost to the to the homeowner, to the homeowner that's actually doing the big upgrades on on the house. And we do the bundle approaches. We do uh, uh, we look at the whole house approach, but we typically see air conditioners as being changed out on homes that come through our home performance program. Things that gives us an opportunity to upgrade the duct system and uh, do attic insulation and uh, windows and solar screens and air infiltration work at the house at the same time. When the homes are electric only, that cost to the customer uh, they can see about. 20% rebate coming back to them. We actually have a here in Austin a interlocal agreement with Texas Gas Service, which actually increases that that rebate. Uh, again, um, those are only for our gas customers, which we focus on the attic insulation, duct repair, and, and weatherization. So that brings that um, that that total rebate to the customer up quite a bit, which helps promote the program. Again, here's the federal tax ID, or I'm just giving you the federal tax credits, up to $1,500. I hear the new program is going to probably up to $500, and has uh, quite a bit of rule changes that are going to be attached to that. But our local loan program, what we do here in Austin, we, we not the, the customers can either go through our whole house rebate program and get the get the get the rebate for doing all the energy upgrades. And like Mark was saying, um, bonus rebates do help because we do have a bonus component when they do all recommended measures in the home. But the 0% loan is our is our other alternative to that bonus rebate program. So for homeowners that are wanting to do the whole upgrades, the new air condition systems, the duct work, windows, solar screens, that type of work, and they're doing all the recommended measures, then we can do we can qualify them for that 0% loan program, or we, or the 4.5. Uh, whichever fits their scenario, their particular home needs. Slide here. So some of the marketing uh, channels that we've been able to tap into and found a lot of success on is using the local newspaper. I mean, the target, our local paper here, which is the Austin American Statesman, has a target market which pretty much profiles our local homeowner profile. So 35 plus years old, affluent, educated, and they uh, read the paper. And we also do the online paper too. Uh, we do marketing campaigns with them also. But that's our that's our workhorse for here in Austin. Uh, we do we do do direct mail campaigns. Um, and we also do community outreach events. Um, we also tap into the local trade associations, getting out in front of them at different times. But primarily, our workhorse here in Austin is the is these type of ads that we run as inserts in the local paper. So here in Austin, um, our home performance program, we're real fortunate. We have approximately five, excuse me, about 50 home performance companies that are registered um, to do work within our programs. Again, we still have that core group of contractors. We have seven to eight contractors. That four to five number has grown to seven and eight. And we uh, we work closely with those folks, and you know we work closely with them and helping them develop their staff, making sure that they have the right equipment to do the jobs, and also making sure that their uh, their staff understands our programs. Um, so we we keep in front of them. We have monthly meetings um, with them. Um, we do value them as a major stakeholder, uh, making these programs successful. Our program staff here is probably approximately in our residential programs probably. Um, probably close to 15 to 20 people that are in that program staff, but that includes our field services folks. But if you take in the, the local contractors, you know, they're 50, 50 home performance companies with their staff 
of at least you know one to one to ten uh, salesmen in these companies, that's quite a bit. Um, getting out into the marketplace and getting these folks to uh, to spread the word about home energy efficiency. So again, Austin Energy's commitment to these folks are to um, you know the ones that are currently registered with us is to help them with their with their program or with their growing their company. Uh, assistance in developing. We help them with their business and marketing and sales training. Um, we just recently taken a big step forward with our home performance registration process. Uh, is that all of our all of our home performance companies today are now mechanical contractors. That's a minimum standard for them to participate in our home performance program, and that was a big step we took over the last 12 months um, to make sure that they that the uh, the bulk of the work that's done in our home performance program is related to the duct system and to the new air conditioning systems. And so we just took that natural step to uh, make sure that the mechanical contractors that are doing the work. Um, uh, they have an opportunity to register as home performance companies with us. We do have weatherization contractors that work closely with our programs, and um, and those are usually handled, I guess, in the in the other classification that Mark and Curse were referring to, of the doing just uh, comprehensive improvements, uh, folks that are just doing attic insulation or doing window replacements or doing attic insulation. Uh, um, duct ceiling. If they're just doing those ones and two measures, um, that's where that contractor falls into that niche. But we do quite a bit of promotional work with the home performance and with that comprehensive group. So in our existing homes program, um, our home performance program, this is where our savings, where we recognize the savings at. So I'm getting into a little bit more detail on on uh, on what what the customers can actually see. So when when we do solar screens on a home, that can actually um, when they do what's called a manual J sizing requirement on the air condition, they could actually downsize that system by up to half a ton when they um, put the right. Um, put solar screens on the right directions of, of the home. In the air in Austin, Texas, we look at the east, west, and south directions being primarily the directions that need to have um, some sort of shading assistance there. Um, attic, attic insulation, uh, we typically see homes as we go out into the marketplace have an existing uh, three to four inches of insulation, which is, again, that's less than, um, you know, if that's an R2 per inch, you're looking at from, um, you know, what is that? from six to eight inches of insulation in a house. So what we come back and recommend is 12 to 13 inches of, of insulation, which takes the home as a final product to an R38 uh, in our market. And so we can see uh, the customers can recognize, you know, savings there um, on that type of work it's done uh, for improving the attic, um, the attic side of the home, uh, the thermal barriers there. Um, duct systems and weather, weatherization, this is actually looking at the duct system and the envelope of the house. Um, so we, we bundle those two into the same classification, but when we do our, our duct measurements, duct leakage measurements, uh, we're seeing an, an average of 27% as being a starting point, which is, uh, again, that's, that's a high standard, and the national standards we bring those down to is uh, less than 10% on that side. And then coming to once you do all these major major upgrades in, in the house, um, you can actually downsize the air conditioner. Like I mentioned under solar shading, you could downsize the air conditioner. You could actually get in there and uh, do 50% more efficient system, which can be right sized with a new air duct system, which is where we see a lot of bonus, really a lot of pluses. Next slide. So what does our process look like here in Austin? What's different from us than, uh, than the rest of the country? Um, our process is more of a sales process. Um, how customers go through, if we start at the bid, bid approval stage, the customer contacts the home performance company, and they must be registered with us, and, on, and they do an on-site assessment The contractors trained to provide that service. Once that bid approval is, or once that consumer or customer uh, um, agrees to the contract, work between them and the vendor, them and the contractor, home performance company, we'll actually come out as Austin Energy, come out and do a verification on a home. Um, uh, and, and, and then that will approve the work for uh, for the next phase of, of it. So the work's performed, and it's done to our program standards, which again, they all meet the national um, the national uh, home performance energy star standards there. They do ending testing, and they provide those all to us at the final inspection. Um, at the final inspection, our inspector will walk through the house, 
answer any questions with the consumer. Again, when we do our verifications back at the bid summary with the consumer, we're, we're answering questions. We're that third-party liaison working with them, answering, uh, answering any kind of technical questions that they may have at that time. And then, again, at the final inspection is really when we try to spend time with them and make sure they understand their, uh, you know, the improvements that were made at their home. On that side, and then to close that gap, to close that circle, um, we have a measurement and verification group here at Austin Energy that actually um, goes in and does utility bill analysis. They look at all the past participants, and then we close it also further, and we survey those customers and to see you know what we're doing and where our gaps are and where we could do to make improvements, kind of closing that quality control and quality assurance circle. Looks like the slide got a little. A little backwards there, but um, basically um, Austin Energy here, our staff, um, which is kind of another unique position that we put us in is Austin Energy is that we're being a municipal utility. We also are city government. Um, so our staff here, can uh, we have trained mechanical inspectors, uh, mechanical code inspectors, plumbing code inspectors, electrical inspectors. And that's been a real value added to our local program um, here, to our local home, uh, home performance companies. Because typically a home performance job requires a new air, new air condition system, um, new, new furnace, new gas lines, new duct system. And what's a, what's a nice value is that instead of having to contact a local permitting office and schedule a different inspector to come out into the home to clear the permit, we can get all that done with one shot uh, or at one time, which where we found it to be really, really positive. Um, we've actually, uh, all of our staff here is BPI certified. Um, all of our field reps are. Um, many of them are getting their heating and cooling uh, specialists. Um, but another certification that we've actually tapped onto or, or really held on to is um, is getting their air balancing, uh, air duct balancing certification. And that's really to help them really understand the air flows in the house, not only the science, the building science behind how a, how a, how a house performs as, as a system, but how that duct system can be sized and is supposed to be sized to perform correctly for that customer. Some of the other benefits to the uh, to the home performance company is that when they're out there giving a competitive bid to a co to a customer uh, on a particular home, it it helps le level the playing field. When we come out and do our verification uh, with that with that home inspector, I'm um, excuse me, with that home performance contractor, salesman, and that homeowner, and we're answering those questions, um, that definitely. Um, Gives uh, gives a level of, uh, increases the level level of satisfaction and level of confidence for not only us as a program staff that the contractors are promoting the programs correctly, uh, but also that the customer is understanding uh, what's being done to the home and actually as and, um, and 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 how they can go get support or get further help if they need help um, wait with the house to move, moving into forward. We also see it as another benefit as. Uh, working with that customer is um, getting them introduced to other program services that we uh, we offer too. So w when we come back and survey that customer, we we definitely we encourage them to you know to learn more about our solar program here in Austin, to learn more about our um, our load management programs that we have here in Austin. Next slide. So this really ties into what Chris, why he was asking me to come uh, talk to you all today is, is our home performance program has a certificate of completion. And this certificate is something that we've, we've, we've introduced into the marketplace here. We probably started it back in 2003 when we really started getting it out into the market. But basically what it tells, gives that, that customer just came through the, come, came through the home performance program, gives them an idea that this house has met a quality standard a high level standard that's recognized not only locally but nationally. And that seems to be a lot of value um, for, for where we see. And then we also tie this certificate program into our new disclosure law too that, that's in place. And I'll talk about that in a in a couple slides when we when we move down. But but this certificate program has been a nice opportunity for us to put our best foot forward for the consumer and also for the um, and for the contractors because they some of them actually want to see this framed and actually want to see it d displayed um, so it really gave us a nice opportunity to get out in front of the customer and, and, and promote what they've done and what they've invested in in their home and I said and this this home and home energy excuse me this home performance certificate is only for doing all the recommended measures that we recognize it's not 
we, we don't include it in our comprehensive uh, rebates that we have for customers. It's just for the ones that do the whole package, the whole house concept. So where, where was Austin going to go next? I mean, we had um, you know 25 years, 26 years of program here on, on the ground here in Austin, Texas, a, uh, a mature DSM market, if you will, and it got the city council looking at it. They started looking at a. They launched here in 2007 um, a climate change initi uh, initiative, and here we call it the Climate Protection Plan. But this initiative here uh, was to make Austin the leading city in the nation. That, in the, in the effort to reduce and reverse the negative impacts of global warming. Excuse me a second. Just lost my screen here. Sorry, Chris, hold, hold on a second. Chris, I just lost my screen. Hold on a second. Here. That's okay. So we're uh, we're on hold for a second. Okay. You got that? No, not yet. Let me see what's going on. Hold on one second. All right. Maybe while um, uh, while Tim's uh, works to get his screen back, um, we can address uh, one or two of the the, the questions that, that that came in uh, that we didn't get a chance to get to. Um, Mark, there was a there was a question about. Um, uh, examples of contractor businesses and um, uh, what they. I'm oh, sorry. You were you ready, Tim? Chris, if if you could advance for me, can you? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Okay, I I got my slides printed, so I'm good. Okay, okay. there you go. So we're on the timeline. Okay, great. Well, um, so back so backing up, looking at the the timeline for the climate protection plan, which was the uh, the climate change initiative here in Austin. This timeline was put in place um, to uh, to kind of help us understand wh where where we are and, and help you understand what Austin's been through and w what steps we've taken. Um, so, it, in December two thousand seven, in two thousand seven, the city council. Uh, appointed the city manager to form a task force of, of members there to do to go and take a look at disclosure laws here in Austin, uh, how to how to go about imp, imp, implementing these not only in one market class but across the board in res, residential, multi, multifamily, and commercial markets. So they met for you know pretty close to eight months on the market uh, to get out into uh, excuse me um, to. To take their their comments and working together, um, and a couple slides up, I'll have a list of the stakeholders that were all included there. But it, uh, but in 2008 was when the uh, so the ordinance they they met they convened in February of 2008 and November of 2008 is when the city ordinance was approved and approved the city code. And the way the city code was written uh, was that we had six months to implement this type of ordinance here in Austin. And uh, that took us to June 1 of 2009. So that, that ordinance actually took effect for single family homes, for multifamily and commercial. And then, in, and then we have a report back to city council date of summer of 2011. Go to the next slide. So there's so there's five big components that are tied to the Austin Climate Protection Plan. One is the municipal plan. Uh, one is the utility plan. The other one's the home and buildings, community, and go neutral. So these big these five areas um, were looked at as a full comprehensive plan um, for the whole city uh, as a whole. I won't go into the details on it, but if you go to the next slide, Chris, uh, we'll get into the homes and buildings section. Okay. And. And the home, homes and building section was actually looking at both new construction and existing homes. And so, on the new construction side, they're they're moving forward with a, a net zero capable home for 2015, pretty aggressive uh, initiative. Um, but the one that really points out to what this existing homes uh, disclosure is 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 the third bullet there: D uh, disclosure of energy efficiency use and facilitate energy improvements in existing homes and buildings. So this took us uh, took us an opportunity to actually go back and look at all the existing homes in in Austin, and and even though we've had programs in place since 1982, take another step. Let's take another dive and and look at the the impact that we're making on our local market here. 
If you go to the next slide. Okay. So here, um, starting on in June 1st of 2009, uh, they define the, the residential home sector, the multifamily property sector, and the commercial sectors. The, the residential sector was one that was tied that had to be implemented immediately. Um, so we were on a fast timeline to get this you know, to get all of the program assets in place by uh, by May of 2009, which which we achieved. Uh, multifamily and commercial sectors, a little bit different scenarios. Um, those uh, multifamily is required to have an audit and have it um, in a, available uh, to potential residents or, um, or even to existing residents. The same with commercial. They have to have a building rating done on their, on their structure, on their building, and disclose it to potential buyers and to current um current tenants of their property. But they have until June of 2011 to report those those audits and those um, those ratings to City of Austin, Austin Energy on that side. So we're, we're going to focus primarily on the on the residential piece of this. We can go to the next slide. Okay. So thing, things to know about uh, what the residential disclosure law here in Austin uh, requires. Um, We'll, we'll get into the stakeholders. I'll, I'll share with you uh, experiences with them, uh, with that group, um, types of buildings, and, and really what, what you really need to know in order about your building class or building stock before you start this. Also, it's important to know, you know, uh, about the utility programs and government agencies that are there. And as last, the resources and the infrastructure to support this type of initiative. It's, it's extremely important. Go to the next slide. So the residential home, okay. There you go. So the the residential homes uh, section of the of the ordinance, ordinance um, it requires the seller to perform an audit and disclose it prior to time of sale. And so this is on the on the seller side of the transaction. So when a home is being uh, uh, debated or being put on the market for sale. Um, they must consider having an energy audit done on that home and having it disclosed through the sales process. And the ordinance, um, it didn't require upgrades. So there was no requirement of upgrades. But interesting enough, the, the task force, when they initially were um, putting this, uh, writing the backup for the ordinance, the task force actually had mandatory upgrades in the, in the conversation. Um, there was, as you can imagine, there was pushback in the local community, um, you know, saying that this was uh, man mandatory, was not going to work in the community, and there was campaigns uh, put out by local uh, local associations to, you know, you know, to try to change the minds of the of the of the folks in, on this task force, and um, and and they did. They uh, the actual the the leaders of the task force, which I wasn't involved with, but the leaders of the task force took a step back looked at the ordinance and really felt that it was it was valuable to go ahead and just take a step and let's just do a let's do a voluntary compliance component to it. So when the ordinance was passed back in two thousand and eight, there was also resolution with resolution goals that, that were passed along with it. And so that compromise to voluntary upgrades um, are embedded in that resolution and you can go on Austin Energy's website and, and link link over to all the resolution backstop goals that are attached to this. But the exemptions were extremely important in the residential sector because in, in residential um, we're looking at homes that are 10 years plus. And that decision was made on 10 years plus uh, because the homes that are built less than 10 years, we had some energy code and some building code improvements that really changed the housing stock here in Austin. Um, we also have worked with um, let's see, the, the low income qualified for free weatherization um, as, as an exemption because those core improvements made through the, through the weatherization program do, do meet the minimum requirements as identified by the by the audit that that uh, was developed by this ordinance, and I'll cover what's in the audit in a few slides. Um, but the ordinance also went a little bit further, also went a further in uh, getting into uh, some of the personal situations that can can affect a transaction, uh, home being in probate, um, home going through a divorce. Um, 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 you know, uh, uh, the eminent domain situation. So there was there's some there's some uh, conditions that are built into it um, to help with those particular situations. So it's not a you know it wouldn't be a uh, a, a true 
impact you know, on the finances of the home or of the seller of the home to have the audit done um, if they've met one of those exemptions that are there. So that was the idea behind the exemptions. Go to the next slide. Okay. So again, uh, uh, this, the Austin City Code, which is 6-7, uh, requires that homes that are in the city limits and receive Austin Energy Power um, must receive an energy audit. That, that's the first line of the first line of qualifying at home for energy improvements, um, or excuse me, for disclosure. Um, our service area here in Austin Energy goes extends further than our city limits. So this is real important for us to build processes in place for folks to to be able to go to and understand whether they, they need to even have an audit uh, completed. In a couple slides, I'll show you the processes that we put in place on that. Um, next slide, please. Okay. This is looking at the list of stakeholders that were involved with the task force, um, and these are folks that we're still working with um, today. Uh, again, we're about we're 18 months into this ordinance, and um, from the implementation date of June 1 of 2009. But it's, it's extremely important to re to recognize that the there's city commissions that are that are heavily invested in uh, um, in helping make decisions and. Um, uh, move this forward. Um, the Resource Management Commission is a commission that we work with on a regular, on a monthly basis. The Electric Utility Commission, which is the city's uh, electric utility commission, we work with them on a on a monthly basis, um, providing them updates on where we are. But the the ones the ones that we work with a lot closer, which are extremely important in other markets too, or with these type of disclosures, are the Board of Realtors. Our, our local Board of Realtors is really. Uh, Really taking a step and re reach across the table and uh, and sit down meetings with them and develop campaigns to help educate their their local realtors here in Austin. Um, the local board Austin Board of Realtors has about a membership of somewhere around 10,000 members. Well, a lot of them, as you probably know, realtors um, probably don't do it full time. So maybe about 10 to 15 percent of them actually do it full time. Is what I've seen, and so it's real important to have campaigns in place to keep these folks engaged and educated about this disclosure law. That don't forget about it through the real estate transaction. Make sure they're advising their their seller and also their buyer uh, that this disclosure law is in place for them and the values behind it, uh, uh, so they understand. Um, another group that was extremely important to work with was the uh, apartment association here in Austin that was on the multifamily compo the component of the ordinance. And then also the, the BOMA group, which is the Building Owners Management Association. Um, those folks all were key players in uh, moving this ordinance along, and they're, continue, uh, they're continually got chairs at the table, places at the table here uh, with staff as we move forward with the implementation of the ordinance here. Go to the next slide. Okay. So one of the things that we really you know, we really had to take a step back and understand uh, here in Austin uh, is you got to know your building stock. You got to understand your uh, understand your community's history, your go your growth patterns. Understand um, when the construction booms were and what were the common construction practices during those booms. Um, you know, again, here in Austin, we had construction booms in the 80s and 90s. Um, the 80s uh, quality of construction, um, those are primarily our clients today that come through our home performance programs are the homes that go through uh, that go through home performance were from the 1980s. We're starting to see um, you know some of the homes that were built in the 90s come through the programs now. So it's extremely important to you know to take a step back and look at your at your zoning laws and see where where those homes are. Uh, if that information is available. Go to the next slide. Okay. Okay. Um, here with the residential building codes, I mean, these are also not only the zoning, but the building codes, too. Uh, this will help with the construction patterns um, and seeing what the common practices were in those different sectors. And we use this information definitely in our home performance uh, outreach campaigns, too. We use the same information. Um, but, you know, type type 1, or excuse me, um, building type A, A1, A2, those uh, A1s are primarily one- and two-family homes, so those are duplexes single family and duplexes. Uh A2 you get into the multifamily um uh, structures and then commercial structures too. On that. Go to the next slide. Okay. Um 
understanding and knowing your utility rate structures uh, in your marketplace is is something that that we're real close to and we're real fortunate you know, again being Austin Energy and a municipal utility is that we we have that data we 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 run data analysis on our customers uh very regularly um but on you know, I just put this slide up there just to kind of show you how our rate structures are are put together, um, looking at residential rates to general service to um, EO2 to uh, general service EO6 accounts. But in understanding how that ties into the energy usage of the structures too, um, you know, going back to the to, to the other slide comment was, um, you know, one and two family homes. Um, you know, we understand those those usage those usage patterns in multifamily homes. We understand those usage patterns. Go to the next slide. Okay. Um, let's see. So the the utilities again, being Austin Energy uh, here, and you know, being uh, not having deregulation in a, in a municipal, in, not being in a deregulated market uh, as being a municipality. Um, our programs have been in place since 1982. Um, so we've had the programs in place for our Home Performance Energy Star program, our free weatherization uh, home assistance programs. Um, we have great relationships, partnerships with our local gas provider um, that, that we work together on, and then also with the local county weatherization programs too. We um, we do a lot of co-op type work together uh, with them. So it's important to know who these players are in your local community when you uh, when you move forward with those type of disclosures, because they may be doing energy improvements on homes that may or may not be recognized through the disclosure. On that side, go to the next slide. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is this a residential infrastructure? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the audit, so as part of what we needed to put in place to uh, to meet that May deadline, we, we had to make sure we have an audit designed. We had to make sure we had the the auditors trained, and we we relied hev heavily heavily on the the ResNet and the BPI affiliates here in, in the local Central Texas area, um, private training centers, community colleges. Um, uh, grant funded programs uh, through uh, like the WA through the ARA grants that came into Austin um, were extremely beneficial to us in preparing the marketplace, making sure we had at least you know the uh, the amount of uh, you know we, I believe we had 80 auditors ready to go May 1 of 2009. Um, today we have almost 200 individual auditors that are qualified to provide this type of program service. Um, we also were important to have a database uh, to uh, to be able to provide the analysis necessary to make sure you understand and interpreting the data correctly on what's what's being provided. Um, pub public information, um, you know, our, our websites and um, the collateral created, the av advertising, um, all the PS uh, the, the the PR events that we've done, and the call center support you know being a city city government i mean uh, there's a, there's a call center that the city has but there's also a call center that our utility has through our customer service group um it was real important to keep all those folks abreast of this this type of ordinance and this type of information and um and training and getting them all prepared for the marketplace go to the next slide okay so the Looking at, uh, you know, we'll, I'll get into some current stats about the program. Uh, we will look at the residential home stats, statistics, uh, what's in the audit, um, get into some of the marketing campaigns, and then how we're tying it together to the home performance program. Go to the next slide. Okay. Okay. So the stats, uh, the statistics that we have today is uh, right over uh, like 4,800 uh, audits have been submitted to Austin Energy uh, um, through the ordinance, um, through the uh, the local auditors that we have trained to provide this type of service. Um, we do have a first year goal that we're still it's still un under review on on what we're where we are with that number, but preliminary number right now is right around a, right around 10 percent of the homes that are coming through. Uh, that are going through the sales process are participating in in our our home performance program. Um, so that's that's a pretty good stat from that point. It's a starting point. We have a resolution goal. It's pretty aggressive of being 25 percent, but we're we're right now we're at 10 percent with that number, and um, and we're doing further analysis to um, to take a closer look at that program. 
Um, there's also there's been a, a local grant that was uh, awarded here in Austin, and uh, they're also going to be taking a look at our our customer base too. And as it as the ordinance was put in place, and lo looking at the folks that have actually done the uh, that have done the audit through the real estate transaction, and also look at our u utility data on the customers that have uh, um, actually participated in the programs, and they're they're going to do a little deeper dive on that customer. Okay. One second here. Go to the next slide. Okay. So what, what's in the energy audit? Um, again, th this audit was designed as a simple assessment. Um, it was something that was, we had some um, mar some marching orders up front not to exceed a two to $300 range for an audit. Um, so staff went back, and again, the home performance staff went back to look at this and see where, where do we get more value for our dollar when we make our energy improvements. And so that's where these items were identified. So we're looking at windows. The weatherization, which is the envelope of the house, the attic insulation, the air duct system, and they do a specialized uh, air, duct, air duct testing also, which is measuring uh, the pressure loss and the CFM loss in the system. And then they make an estimate on what the efficiency rating is on an air conditioning system there. Go to the next slide. Okay. The insulation and air infiltration, um, it was, it's real important to, you know, for the for when we're working with the real real estate community here, that they understood, you know, what these steps are. So we put together ed educational campaigns to go out and go meet with with uh, the local real estate offices here, and we we've done group trainings of you know two to three hundred realtors, um, real estate professionals, and then we've done smaller offices down to about you know like five to ten. But we we go through these these next couple of slides are really just you know, these are slides that I actually pulled from that presentation just to help explain to them you know what we're looking at to help bring them along in that ed educational process. Yeah. Go to the next slide. Okay. So not many real estate professionals, as as you can imagine, get into the attic. And so when we start snapping pictures of attics and showing them, um, they they get real real scared about is this going to hurt the real estate transaction. And um, and so what we do is we try to reassure them that this audit is just looking at the house as it sits today. It's not it's not doing anything but making uh, recommendations for energy improvements. It's not doing mandatory upgrades, um, and it should not hold up the um, the, the sales process at all. It should be just considered a disclosure to help the the, the new home buyer on understand what they're getting into, making sure that they understand that there's there is no insulation in that house. There is no there is an air, older older air conditioning system there on on the house, or there is duct leakage there that that could be that could be improved uh, for that home. Okay. Okay. Okay, it looks like I'm back up, Chris. Okay. All right. Um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, we'll do this one. So the duct systems, you know, when we go and look at the duct systems, it was real, I mean, it was really eye-opening for the real local real estate professionals to to understand what, what we're looking at for duct work. You know, we, we could have all these, you know, fancy words, you know, poorly designed, damaged, deteriorated, leaky ducts, connections, but until you show them, you actually show them what what the systems are when you go to the when you go to the next slide here 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 it comes um you're looking at different types of duct systems you know, like gray gray flex i mean no no real estate agent understood what gray flex is or what duct board is and so that was a really uh really good process and and we're continuing those those presentations to these groups and helping them with their ed, their education of uh you know what what we look for in in the home but the next slide here coming up this was really really eye opening for for the real estate professionals you know looking at them and just seeing as you, know, you see a house like this you can understand that this is a prime candidate for our home performance program and uh, and i know mark probably has dozens of photos that are just like this too and and you too chris but um but these are really compelling um photos to help people understand that you know there is there is more work to be done um in in that house and that their if their home buyer that is you know might be you know at the limits of their of their mortgage, can they truly afford a home with those extra utility bills? Um, you know, to to help this. So, really, what does the audit mean to us, and what does it mean to the consumers? Um, it's a simple comparison of 
of the house. Um, it identifies cost effective upgrades, quick paybacks to customers, and those are upgrades that are recognized through our home performance program. Um, in the report, um, we, we just talk in generality in the current report about um, the energy savings and how it can lower your bills and, and make, uh, make home ownership more affordable. But I think that last statement there, that make home ownership more affordable, um, is, is something that really should be at the forefront of every disclosure that's that has put out there not not only in a in the single family market but also in the multifamily and the commercial sectors too on that side so some of the oops sorry I think it's, it's, it's working. So on the educational campaigns that we have, um, we've actually put together on our website here at austinenergy.com um, a list of a lot of a lot of information uh, available to the customer. Um, I lost the system again, Mark. Sorry, or um, Chris, for some reason. Okay, I'm good. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we, we've actually put together a, a lot of information out on our website to help customers understand their step process and what they go through um, um, uh, for the ordinance and, and how important it is for them to um, to comply with this as a, as a city law and how the law is, 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 is structured here in, in Austin. So the next slide, you can go to the next slide, please. Yep. The next slide actually gets into the, the client. Um, you know, we... This is for this is for the public, and the public being the the buyers agents, the seller agents, the homeowners, and helping them go through a simple customer survey and see if they even need an audit. Because if the home is under 10 years old, they they meet one of the exemptions, and so they don't really need to disclose anything as through that process. But what we've done through that process, we've actually developed a a document that they could actually hand off to a, a new home buyer to tell them that my house is under 10 years old and it doesn't need to have an audit as per the disclosure law. So that, that was real important to have that. And then again, the having the call-in centers um, up, up and running and equipped and, and how to field those questions when they come up um, from from these type of folks, you know, whether it's a realtor or an agent or uh, or a home homeowner on that side. You can go to the next slide. Okay. So some of the marketing campaigns that we put in place um, uh, for this particular uh, ordinance, we're looking at uh, our utility bill. We, we, we did an insert there. Uh, we did Austin American Statesman insert, uh, which was uh, which is tied together what we did with our that last uh, slide I showed you under the Home Performance Program. Uh, we did a city press conference working with that, but primarily you know getting the getting the work out or, or getting the word out to the marketing channels and, and getting that message coordinated between those stakeholder groups that was extremely important uh, from from our standpoint and from the uh, from the local stakeholders and task force members that were involved with this at this initiative if you go to the next slide okay this is our this is one of the pieces that we put out initially and again we, we took a approach initially is that this is a city law um, and this is something you need to comply with um, and so we put all the hard line requirements there for for the customers to know that if their house is over ten years old and doesn't meet one of the exemptions then they need to comply and they, they need to they need to go through this and that's what this document was created if you go to the next slide Okay. Okay. Um, the energy conservation audit and disclosure. Uh, this this guide was actually put together specifically for the home buyers and sellers and homeowners. Um, this was and this and in this guide here, we put in there uh, lots of marketing information about what the ordinance means um, and what they can do to go make energy improvements to the home. Because making uh, energy improvements through the home performance program was a was a one of the exemptions that was identified through the way the ordinance was developed. So what this campaign did was it tied that gap, it, it closed that gap for for the customers and uh, for the home sellers and the realtors on that side to help help explain that story. Okay, go to the next slide. Okay. So what are we seeing with with this first round? Again, we've been in this ordinance for about 18 months now, and um, and it it is it is amazing. It's pretty close to what we've seen in the home performance program. Uh, the ducks leaking uh, at least you know, twice the amount, twice the amount of the uh, 
of, of the code standard of 10. So they're coming in right over 20%, 20, 22, 25% uh, duck leakage is what we're, what we're seeing. Um, the homes are coming in um, needing, you know, they're coming in around R15, R17, which means that they need additional 10 inches of insulation in that attic in order to bring it up to a to an energy efficient standard that we recognize here as R38 in that attic. Um, and again, 98% of the homes received at least one of these recommendations um, uh, through that because in our audit, um, we actually go in and um, uh, so we, we data mine that from our audits. So 68% of the homes in the, uh, needed home weatherization. Over half of them needed solar screens or windows improvements. 68% um, of them needed a air duct renovation, which means they needed a new duct system. And close to 80% of them needed attic insulation. Pretty, pretty big, pretty, pretty compelling story. Uh, so that, this is the next story. The, the next step is what we're taking. If you go to the next slide, okay. Um, this is this is probably the one that's going to tie it together. Is that the opportunity awaits? Um, you know, these are the potential savings from these homes that Austin Energy can recognize if these homes made these energy improvements. Um, and our and again, our next step for for marketing to these folks is is to the new home buyers. We have campaigns that are in place that are going to be starting uh, starting in January that are going to go out and and market to these folks that have been in the home, you know, three, six, nine months, twelve months out. Um, they they've been in their house. After they get into the home, um, they get their finances under control, and uh, um, and then they can really take a step and really die, really understand what the audit is. And so we're going to reach out to them in a campaign uh, and help them understand that we're here to help them with with these energy questions and concerns and get them in contact with a home performance company and try to help close that gap so they can actually make those energy improvements. Then on the flip side, you know, the the, the utilities benefit into the community, I mean, these are the potential savings that we could see, uh, which are really amazing, uh, you know, from a program stand -up standpoint. I, I think there would be a lot of utilities around the country uh, uh, lining up for these type of numbers. If you go to the next slide. Okay, and for uh, newer closing in on the four o'clock uh, hour, we, we may go a couple of minutes here just to wrap things up. But this is okay. the, the last slide Tim's got. Yep, this is the last slide. So you know, this kind of ties it together with our lessons learned and the marketing compliance to exemptions. That's you know, when we first initially launched the ordinance uh, marketing campaign, again, we were letting people know that this is a law, and um, and now now we're trying we're changing that messaging, making it more into if you get the energy improvements completed, um, you can actually be exempt from this ordinance requirement. So there's a couple of double prong approach on how we're how we're approaching these customers at, at this time. The current audit form, yeah, it, it uh, we definitely recognized initially that it does need to be uh need to be improved because it is it does have technical uh information in it that's that again, probably like a lot of ResNet type of quality audits or uh, write-ups, you know, it, it's just not as consumer friendly as it could be at that time. Um, the, you know, in, enforcement for the for this ordinance uh, for the re residential side, it is it is a challenge, and that's currently currently being uh, being reviewed again by by City of Austin attorneys uh, on how to properly uh, move forward with enforcing these type of ordinances and this type of initiative here. Um, some some properties or some uh, some pieces of the community that were not completely addressed in the ordinance were con condominiums and commercial buildings, and and the reason with condominiums were because the way the audit was structured is um, um, a condo owner may or may not have true um, true um, access to all the areas uh, to make the energy improvements that were recognized through what, what was developed as an audit for us. So we got a little bit more work to do on, on that and then the definition of a commercial building. Uh, we have some commercial structures that that are um, that are small, but we're still asking for ratings on. So we got some more work on our side that we're doing um, through administrative rule cleanup um, to get that out, and that should happen probably after the first of the year is what we're working on in that. Uh, our, our database is as comprehensive as anybody's, um, but it still needs work. Um, we, we, got a, we got a good staff that's uh, circulated around keeping up with that database, um, but we still need to be able to do data. Uh, deep, deep, deeper dives with that um, that data that's coming in and and uh, getting into that customer uh, uh, history and 
um, and understand how it ties into the county system on that side. And then the, the program staffing is uh, e extremely important, and we're continuing to work through those issues right now is making sure we have the right assets in place on, on the city side to keep this uh, initiative um, out, out ahead of target where we are right now. And that should take me to the last uh, last slide there, Chris. Yep, okay. Uh, thank you so much, Tim. Um, we are uh, actually a minute or two past the witching hour, and I want to be cognizant of the fact that uh, that we're there and that um, asking people to hang uh, with with all of this information uh, for three hours is, is, a, is a long time. Um, so um, I think, I, I know there are several questions that came in. I've, I've been keeping keeping track of them. Um, and I think what I would like to do is, um, is, is suggest the following on that front. Um, to the extent that there's a few that we can come up with some easy, quick, written answers, um, I'll, I'll volunteer and hope it's okay with Tim and, uh, and Mark that we'll try to get some written answers out to the questions that came in, uh, the, the ones that are easy to answer that way. Um, and then uh, for, for those that aren't and for any follow-up, again, I'll just invite, as I did at the beginning, um, anyone who has questions or wants to talk about any of this stuff further to feel free to call me, Mark, or Tim. Um, or multiples of us, if you if you're so inclined, um, we're all happy to we're all happy to take your uh, your calls. So um, again, I want to thank uh, 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 thank everyone for for participating in uh, in in this session, um, and and in particular thank Mark and Tim for being willing to put their time into putting these presentations together and presenting them to you. Um, and uh, uh, we will be following up with some additional information on on how to. Uh, the links to track down these presentations as well as the recorded presentation uh, and other information as uh, is noted along the way. So um, uh, I think with that we will sign off and uh, I'll say thanks again to everybody and Mark and Tim in particular. Thanks all. Bye Mark and Tim. Bye Chris.